This L cast is recorded in front of a live streaming audience. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cellcast. Joining me today is a man who, well, he's just feeling like a nightmare. Welcome, Jacob. I can't do that in the intro. Sorry. That's hard to edit around. I know. Sorry. I mean, I technically can, but it's a pain in the butt. Okay. It's easier oh. to start over. <laughs> Okay, so the 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 mm, mm, you're welcome, patrons. Uh, the the whole reason to be like my apologies, Drew. Be like for some reason when you said you know, you know, nightmare. Instantly, I had this goofy line that came from Power Rangers the movie, and for some reason that was like, welcome I, to my nightmare. That one, yeah, that <laughs> that line. And for some reason, it cracked me up, and I was like, oh crap, I can't get out of it. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be a fun episode. Okay, starting over again. The cell cast is recorded in front of a live streaming audience. Boy, is it ever. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cell Cast. Joining me today is a man who... Well, he's feeling like he, like he wants a little bit of nightmare music. Welcome, Jacob. <laughs> Why, thank you. Um, yeah, nightmare music sounds good. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Why, thank you. Let me use our co-host, a man who was so smitten to get in this junkyard, this band... <laughs> He put a hole in his mother's wash tub and didn't quite realize he could patch that very, very easily. What can Drew? Well, yeah, because now that we have this thing called flex tape that you can get down at Walmart and it's been seen on TV and we can see that with enough of the stuff, you can patch a windscreen in the bottom of a boat for some reason. Ah. Actually, that may be something else. But whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, well, so Drew. Tonight, we are reviewing Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. A Jim Henson production. Yes. Which technically makes it Muppets, but also it yeah. isn't. We'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we are the connection to Muppets. Oh, well, Jim Henson's put certain characters in everything at one point. That is true. It, there's a reason the first three Muppet movies have uh, uh, cameos from Sesame Street, because it's just it was all one company, pretty much. But uh, yeah, we are going to be reviewing that tonight. In fact, you want to just go ahead and jump into our spoiler-free thoughts on that? Yeah, let's do that. <sighs> Certified fresh and spoiler-free. This is my first viewing mm. outside of watching a couple minutes of it a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Was it last year? Doesn't matter. Uh, a couple years ago. I, I, I say that not knowing if I watched it when I was younger. Because I have a suspicion I may have like a long time ago, mm -hmm. but it's really before my memory started solidifying. You know I what I mean? You. Three, four uh, years old. Yeah, probably. I could see this maybe coming on TV and us and, and and us watching it or recording it and watching it. I can tell you this was not on any of the bootlegged VHS tapes that my grandpa recorded for me. So I don't know if I actually watched it before this viewing completely or not. Okay. Though I know the story because it's basically Gift of the Magi. It is. Uh, which is not a bad thing. This is no. actually done very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed it. It's The musical numbers are nice and catchy. It's not your standard Christmas 
carol m- music mm-hmm. it is paul williams uh and he does a good job with this stuff it's kind of bluegrassy in a way it is very uh, except for uh the nightmare rock band song yeah which is just well it's electric mayhem before electric mayhem mm-hmm. um well actually during electric mayhem but either way uh yeah i actually i, I enjoyed this film it was fun and uh yeah what are your thoughts on it uh, I believe this is the second time watching it because I know a friend of ours. Well, oh, you have to watch this movie, so we watched it, and uh, I enjoy it. It's not my cup of tea, but it has qualities that are nice, and some things are like okay. I get you can say you can tell this was on a budget. It's like performance wise, it's done very well, and they were doing new things during that time period that hadn't had not been done so that that mm-hmm. period. But I mean, like well, it's enjoyable. This is a test bed for many of the things they would do yes. for the Muppet movie. Yes. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else before we jump into the full spoiler filled section? Um, I wish Kermit was here. Jumping ahead, are we? Maybe. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Hopping ahead, are we? Maybe. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into the full spoiler filled section then. The following is a spoiler filled review for the film Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Listener discretion is advised. Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas was directed by Jim Henson and written by Jerry Jewell and is based on the book by Lillian and Russell Hoban. Getting into the cast, uh, we have Jerry Nelson playing Emmett Otter, Weasel, Doc Bullfrog, Melissa Rabbit, and Yancey Woodchuck. Hmm. He he is pro- among the Mupp- the regular Muppet cast. He's more well known for playing Robin the Frog, Kermit's nephew. Oh, okay. Got frog. It. I think I said frog, and I meant frog, but yeah. either way. Frank Oz was the pl- played Chuck and was the p- m- uh, Muppet performer for Ma Otter. Yes. And, of course, he's most famous for playing Miss Piggy and Yoda. Mm-hmm. And during the recording, the, the the filming, he actually voiced Ma Otter during the well, as they were mm-hmm. recording it. But his voice would later be replaced by Marilyn Sokol, mm-hmm. who uh, played, Ma, of course, like I said, played Ma Otter in this. Mm-hmm. And in Sesame Street, she played Kathleen the Cow. Oh, hmm. I have no idea who that is. But okay. Not on either, but I thought it was a funny name. Okay. Dave Goals played Wendell, the pop-eyed catfish, and Will Possum. And, of course, he's known for playing Gonzo the Great. Mm-hmm. Or the Great Gonzo, I think, technically. is. I think I got the word, those words in the wrong order. Either way. Uh, next, we got Richard Hunt, who played Charlie, the Lizard, and George Rabbit. And he usually plays Sweetums, hmm. the giant monster one. Yeah. And then uh, Aaron Osker was the voice of Gretchen Fox, or played Gretchen Fox, Hetty Muskrat, Miss Mink, and Old Lady Possum. Mm-hmm. And she normally plays Janice of the Electric Mayhem. Lastly, last but not least, Jim Henson boy, played Harrison Fox, mm-hmm. Harvey, Snake, and Kermit the Frog. Except, if you watch the DVD that we had, and have any home video version prior to when Disney bought the Muppets mm-hmm. in 2006. They have edited Kermit out for legal reasons. Mm. Yeah, I'm not a happy person about that, but we'll come back to that. So you could say you're hopping mad about it? Perhaps. However, uh, Jim Henson also is famous for playing Rolf the Dog, but do you know where Rolf the Dog was originally, what show Rolf the Dog was originally made for? I don't know. You know the uh, the actor Jimmy Dean, yeah. famous for his sausage. Yes, he had a show back in the '60s, I believe, oh. or '70s, called the Jimmy Dean Show. Yes, and it took place. And, and even though it was very obviously on a set, like I mean, they did not stop. They they, they did nothing to hide the fact it was on a set. Yeah. You could see the stands, cameras, mm-hmm. backstage, all that kind of stuff. You know, you know, this kind of shows from that era. Yeah, and but it was supposed to be on a ranch well every ranch needs a ranch hound ah uh, so that's where the so that's where rolf the dog came from got it although he they all rolf the dog was also used on like a purina dog food ad around this time that's also right. yes what's fun though is that rolf 
on through the Jimmy Dean show got to meet Lassie. I remember something about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he had a crush on Lassie at the time. There's a joke there. I'm not making it. Okay. Good. <laughs> I was thinking it. it was like, We're no. both thinking it. Nope. 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 Not going there. Nope. Kingdom Hearts connections. Guess how many? Uh, one. No. Zero. Yes. Okay. There was absolutely nothing. I tried. <laughs> but honestly, it's you just scoured the internet. None that. of the Muppet stuff has made it into Kingdom Hearts yet. Okay. Uh, and most of the Muppet actors have only done Muppet stuff. Mm. So, except for, you know, Frank Oz, he's done a lot of different stuff, but Yoda obviously hasn't shown up, showed up in Kingdom Hearts yet either. So, yeah, no Kingdom Hearts connections. Interesting. What do we got in info and stuff? All right, so info and stuff. IMDb has a score of 8.2 out of 5. Uh, Talking to the microphone. Thank you. Mm. All right. Sorry, over. So for your own stuff, we have our IMDb is a 8.2 out of 10. I could find no information on Rotten Tomatoes about this movie or special. Watch. Can you watch it anywhere? Outside of DVD, I don't think it's streaming anywhere. Yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, Though I didn't do a search. I mean, mm, yeah, keep you, talking. I will give a yeah, look. Yes, so we do that. Uh, production was. Henson Associates, uh, its distribu uh, distribution was originally broadcast on CBS, CBS. Which makes sense is at the time they were uh, broadcasting the Muppet Show over here. True. Uh, it was released DVD via, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this name, uh, Vienna, Vienna uh, Entertainment, or B I V E N D I. Vivendi. Uh, Vivendi. Yeah. They owned Universal for a while. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. In fact, I think technically they it's still the same company, but it's they now trade under NBC Universal instead of Vivendi. I could be wrong on that. Do not quote me. Gotcha. All right. Uh, which, now that you've mentioned that and, and I mentioned NBC, I will go ahead and tell you this is apparently available to, to stream on Peacock. That's right. Which I is the that. NBC service. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because I was do I was doing the uh, my typical stuff doing that. it mentioned it and I just mm -hmm. went blink. Apparently, it's also on Amazon Prime. Yes, its release date was December fourth, nineteen seventy seven. Let's see, its home release in two thousand five. Hit Entertainment released the collector edition DVD, which featured seven deleted and alternative scenes, as well as a lost song that was recorded but never actually used in the special called I was born in a trunk born in the trunk the song was written and for the talent show scene and was performed by the Walterville music store owner due to the sell uh, due to the sell of the Muppets of Disney a year later Kermit scenes and narration was audited Edited? Edited? No, audited. That's probably edited. No, that's what I'm reading here. It says audited. Well, that's an odd way to write to, to say they edited him out of this thing. Yeah, because it's about an otter audited. Oh, that's so silly. <laughs> From this release. On September, this on on December 12, 2015, a remastered version of this. Uh, 1980 special was released, had its cable channel debut alongside the remastered The Bells of Fraggle Rock on ABC Family during its 25 Days of Christmas programming block. A 40th DVD, 40th special a DVD was, of a special was released by Sony Pictures Home Entertainment on October 10th, 2017, followed by a Blu-ray release on... December 18th, 2018 for the 2015 era, and it's going in some kind of weird order, uh, as well as a supplicant DVD and Blu-ray release. Kermit's introduction and closing scene was restored. So apparently you can still find it. 
on, it's, on, on, on later releases. But it's not, well, it's, it's come and gone. Yeah. It's the gone. version you buy now on DVD does not have it. Yeah. But, and it's because of that sale. Yeah. There is a release out there, I think, technically right before the sale, where, yeah. which got it back, put back in. Yes. But when this apparently made it to Fathom Events, they had already taken it back out. So. Okay. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at, there are versions of the movie which still have it. But not ours. Not ours. Yes. So, yeah, see, if, you, if you want to see Kermit in this movie, you can go track it down. Track down a... Per- particular version it, on but Blue that Wing. version will be out of print and will probably be expensive exactly <laughs> exactly so if you want that version you she'll let somebody to do it either way in 2017 a 40th anniversary of the special music uh musician my matt how do you pronounce it his name sure i'm, I'm gonna butcher this who man. The apparently the musician Matt Surwick. Surwick. If we mispronounce the name, Bailey, Matt Surwick produced an official licensed tribute album featuring all all new covers of Paul Williams songs for the special in 2022. The special with Kermit's introduction and ending, but not his own his the other narration was made available streaming on Peacock. Uh, Yes, that's all I have for info and stuff. All right, getting into the summary. Kermit the Frog is introducing the story of Emma Otter when he is interrupted by the Riverbottom Gang, a group of hoodlums made up of Chuck Stoat, Fred Lizard, Howard Snake, Popeye Catfish, and Stanley Weasel, who insult him and steal his scarf. Mm. The scene then shifts to a river featuring Emma and the widowed Ma, who scrape by on a small amount of money Ma gets from doing laundry and Emmett gets from doing odd jobs around their community in Frogtown Hollow. Hmm. Emma and Ma are doing are, are kind to their neighbors despite them being cheated out of what they deserve for the work they do. While window shopping in nearby Waterville, Ma and Emmett wistfully reflect on Pa's life and his unsuccessful snake oil venture. As Christmas approaches, they each hear of a talent contest with a grand prize of $50 and separately decide to enter so they can afford to surprise the other with a present. Ma, a fine guitar for Emmett, and Emmett, a piano for Ma. However, they must sacrifice each other's livelihood to be able to perform. Ma hawks Emmett's tools for dress fabric, while Emmett turns, turns Ma's wash tub into a wash tub base for a jug band, each convincing themselves it is what Pa would have done. Emmett assembles... Wendell Porcupine, Harvey Beaver, and Charlie Muskrat as the Frogtown Hollow Jubilee Jug Band. Emma and Ma each perform well, despite Emmett's band having to frantically change songs after another contestant performs the one they'd been practicing, only to be defeated by the last-minute entry of the Riverbottom Gang as a rock and roll band called The Nightmare. However, as Ma and Emmett's band walk home together disappointed, Ma realizes their two songs could fit together, and as they sing, they are overheard by Doc Bullfrog, one of the talent show judges, who hires them to play regularly in his restaurant. Emma and Ma decide they will be happier performing together than the thankless work they've been doing before, and Kermit concludes the special with Emma, Ma, and the gang playing in front of Doc and his customers. Ah, interesting. Some of that we did not get to see. No, we did not. Anyway, trivia for this. On the documentary about the making of the show on the DVD, singer-composer Paul Williams says that when Jim Henson asked him to write the songs for it, Henson explained that the show was going to be a trial run for a proposed Muppet movie to check out whether the Henson Company could handle certain technical tasks needed to produce a full-length theatrical feature. When the Muppet movie from 1979 came out two years later, Williams also wrote the songs used in that film. The scene where the drum rolls past Emma and Ma Otter Mm -hmm. took over 200 takes to get right. In 2020, Frank Oz wrote in a tweet about how much fun he and Jerry Nelson had doing those takes. The song, When the River Meets the Sea, was one of the songs performed at Jim Henson's funeral. During filming, Frank Oz provided both the puppeteering and voice for Ma Otter, but later Marin Sokol's voice was dubbed over Frank Oz's. Many of the titles of the songs written for the special were suggested by the original book by Russell Hoban. 
the bathing suit that Grandma Otter wore, and downstream where the river meets the sea were songs sung by Emmett and Ma. Ain't No Hole in the Wash Tub is suggested by words that Emmett sings with the jug band. Mm -hmm. The mashup of Our World and Brothers is one of the very first mashups on network television and in American culture overall. Mashups where you fuse two songs from two different groups together. Yeah. Mashups are now so common, are very common, but in 1977, they were unique. Hmm. And that's what I got for the trivia for this. Oh, right. What is your first like for this film? My first like would be, it's a very charming, very down-to-earth mm -hmm. story of two people, or in this case, two otters, are down their luck. And they're, it's this, try to make it in a, a what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? Uh, it's, I can't answer that one no, for no, you. Of course, you can't read my mind. You're not telepathic, are you? I've been clairvoyance has been uh, something I've been told I have, but I, it comes and goes. Scary. It doesn't mean I can read minds. Yeah, it just I means I can put two and two together yeah. and sometimes get five. Yeah. Because I see the one no one else is seeing. Ah, uh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. All right, yeah, yeah. It's uh, my number one is it's a very charming film. It's a very charming story of uh, two characters who are down in their luck and they're trying the best they can. They had this very um, high spirited view on life, even though mm -hmm. they don't have much or they have nothing at all, and they're uh, they're doing their best. They're looking at uh, trying looking everything on the flips on the upside instead of the downside, and uh, they just so happen to have this competition should come up and they're both willing to sacrifice something in order to make the other happy, mm -hmm. or, you know, bring some joy to their life. And uh, it winds up being a good, a, uh, the story wraps itself up very well with, you know, the, 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 the typical charming ending with our characters getting a, a better lease on life mm -hmm. than they started with. So I, I find the story and the just the story overall is very charming. So yeah, it's my number one. I, I, I'm going to agree with you on that one. It's going to be my number one also because, despite the fact this does not really present itself like a traditional Christmas film, as yeah. I mean, a there's only snow in it for half of it for yeah. one thing. Yes, because uh, it's supposed to be taking place in the South. It just takes longer to get cold enough to freeze a river down here. Yes. If it ever does freeze well, a river down here. <laughs> well, depends on what part of the South you're referring to. Well, we don't know exactly which, but considering Kermit the Frog was then telling the story in the original version, mm -hmm. and he is grew up in Florida, mm -hmm. I'm assuming Frogtown Hollow may be Georgia. Okay. Or Mississippi, one of the two. Yes. But I don't know which one. Uh, Maybe Alabama. Hmm. No, that didn't look like Alabama. Probably Georgia. Maybe Georgia. Never been to Georgia, but I hear I, I hear it's very nice in Georgia. I wouldn't know. I've never been there either. Ah, so we have if we have listeners from Georgia, please let us know. But uh, it's an it, it, it's you know, most of your Christmas stuff. You know, it's all it's always White Christmas. I mean, Grant, you do have stuff like the movie White Christmas, where yes. it doesn't snow until the last song when it's time to sing White Christmas. That's true. But in this one, I mean, it's there. Yeah, you do have the fact that they're they're poor. Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of money for Christmas. In fact, they can't even have a tree. All they get is a is a branch. Yeah, which I thought was cute. Yeah. Um, but it's this family down on their luck, mm -hmm. trying the best they can to survive, barely getting by, and they both decide to risk uh, the other one's livelihood, basically for mm -hmm. fifty bucks. Yeah. Actually, Ma is doing it for fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. Emmett's doing it for one fourth of fifty bucks because he's gonna have to split that with the ways. band, which is something I I I, I realized uh -huh. when I was watching that, and I thought they didn't touch on that at all. No, that they didn't. That he can't make a payment on a piano on what has to be fifteen less than fifteen dollars. I don't care how you use it. a piano is going to be more expensive than a guitar. I'm sorry, because <laughs> the guitar was only 40 yeah but uh he didn't quite think this through he's a kid yeah he's like he, he's like 18 probably yeah uh 
he he's not going to be thinking through. In fact, I'm half surprised there wasn't a girlfriend for him to fall in love with somewhere in this. That would be but, funny. Well, that would have probably been just too much for what they were doing. Yeah, to a but, degree. Uh, and yeah, it is like like I said, it's basically Gift of the Magi with a twist. Yes. Uh, and it's you got you got great music that's not traditional Christmas carol music, but mm. still. I can see it. it. It makes sense in this. There's only, there's not even really a Christmas song in this. Mm-hmm. The only thing that really makes it a Christmas thing is you got the idea of giving a gift for Christmas mm-hmm. and it takes place at that time. Yes. The rest of the stuff is like, like the, it could have been taken any time of the year, take place any time of the year. Mm-hmm. But this is just such a nice uh, non-traditional Christmas story. Yes, yes, it's set it's it's set at Christmas and it is do it is a got a Christmas theme, but for the most part it, it's not like your white Christmases or um Miracle on 34th Street or uh, a Christmas carol or or Christmas story for that matter. It is a wholly original take on doing Christmas in a non-traditional mm-hmm. setting and I love that. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, the, I'm gonna say the non-traditional Christmas setting is my first like for this. Okay. What's your second like? My second like would be how it gears towards family mm-hmm. that you have there again. Kind of it bleeds into my first, where you have these two uh, a, mo- a mother and a son. Obviously, they lost their father at some point. Um, kind of arcing to the more traditional what Disney would do. Like yeah, you could have a, a loved one that passed away or is no longer in the picture. And uh, how they 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 reminisce uh, like the father is the kind of like guiding point to these two these two and like all the decisions what would Pa do mm-hmm. as each character would say, and it's uh, you'd have a hard time selling snake oil because no one wants to oil their snake. Like, yeah, I thought that was a clever line. That was a clever line. <laughs> so clever. Um, you you have so many like moments where it's the this mother and father. Du- mother and son duo who are trying their best in order to uh appease the other where it's not the the son is being you know be- a very modern storytelling where like everybody's very selfish mm-hmm. and self-driven and they're not really out for they occasionally try to help someone else they try to help family where this was made in the 70s where you still had that kind of family oriented kind of storytelling and i just i really enjoyed it when you like you have stories like that where they're always trying to lift each other up mm-hmm. and um reminiscing about pa and i just i feel like it's 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 heartwarming it's a heartwarming story where you have it's about family and how they try to do the best with what they have or what they don't have and they just try to lift each other up and i thought that was very uh like i said heartwarming mm-hmm my second like for this actually is going to be the river bottom gang. Oh, because here's the thing. Great. They don't do a lot in this other no. than just be jerks three times throughout this. And apparently before the cut edits a fourth time at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But think it, we got a goat. Mm-hmm. We've got a lizard. We got a snake, a weasel, mm-hmm. and then a catfish. Yeah. And the catfish has to stay in water most of the time. Yes. And they have to come up with so many creative ways yeah, to keep him in the scene. Mm-hmm. The uh, well, My favorite one, I don't, I don't know why this this shows me, but when they are uh, driving under uh, and, and they stop there underneath where uh, Emmett and the jug band are practicing. Yeah. And you, you see, you know, Everyone else is on motorcycles, but the catfish is in a tra- oh. in a trailer being pulled behind, <laughs> being pulled by someone else. And I'm sitting there going, "That's clever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never would have thought of that." Granted, that sh- that you you swing that back in too long, catfish is going to be in a world of hurt. Yes. And I don't normally think of a catfish as an evil animal. Or, or, you know, a, a villainous animal. Right. All the others make sense. Yeah. A, a goat, they're they're always angry. A uh, like weasel, we, yeah. we we know what we we know the problem with weasels. We yeah. we saw we, we see what happens when they laugh too hard. <laughs> uh, I feel like that sometimes. Of course, a snake, obvious, and yeah. then a lizard. Mm-hmm. Those are all things I can kind of see as being you know, evil. And then a catfish. It's like I don't see 
catfish as being like an evil animal. I see them as being good eaten. Uh, that is true. That is so true. But I mean, they are poisonous, so I guess that's kind of where the thought that is. is. True. So well, only the only in, only the barbs are, are are sorry, not poisonous, venomous. Yeah, they are venomous. But anyway, so my my like watching this movie, I think you partially clarified something that was for me. So the leader of the uh, the the gang was Chuck. Was Chuck? I always thought he was a bear. No, he's a goat. Oh, he granted, I thought he was a bear too. Yeah, so I'm like reading this. And gr- granted, I don't think we. Uh, I think because of the helmet, mm-hmm. it's har- kind of hard to tell if he's got horns or not. Yeah, because he looks like a bear. Yeah, but I think he's supposed to be a goat. Huh. It's not very distinguishable, but okay. Well, I mean, the only time you don't see him in his in the with the helmet is going to be during the song, and they don't really stay on anyone long enough to really get a good focus on any of them. But and and plus, he is definitely the doctor teeth of that group. So he's kind yeah. of in the back at the piano or whatever. True. Also, I love the fact that every all the rest of that rock bottom band has an instrument, but all the catfishes, the percussion as he jumps in and out of the water. <laughs> that was clever. And I watched that going, you know, if you actually had to record this song, that means you have to have somebody over there hitting water to produce that part of the sound because <laughs> that's a different sound yes. than normal percussion. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I love the fact that you, they had to find a to keep this catfish in the group. Yeah. Despite the fact there's no reason he should be there. Yeah. The, the, the utilization of a catfish as a character mm-hmm. is very unique. And I think it would be more challenging than anything. I think to, it would to, be, yeah. To incorporate that character into every scene that, that he's the, in. Yeah. That he's in, and they utilize him very well. Mm-hmm. Even though he doesn't really do much. Except he, he wraps himself around the uh the the goat character who looks more like a like a like a bear, but I thought that the, was the snake that did that. Yeah, it was the snake. Oh, never mind, never mind. I, I've got the two characters confused. My mistake. Yeah. Moving forward. No worries. Anyways. So, yeah, that was my second like. What's uh, your third? My third like would be the design of the like the entire uh, world of Emmett Otter. Mm-hmm. Because they're, they're doing two sets. They're doing two sets. They're using this wide... Um, I think it's a total of like four sets, but yeah, either it's a total way, of four sets. But you have these very vast, large sets. Of mm-hmm. It's just like the cameras panning around this uh, this miniature set, mm-hmm. and it's done very well. It'd be like it's for the budget there, the constraints they have on it, and as Jim Henson implied that it's like the kind of a, it's a springboard or springboard to something else. Yeah, they were using it as a test as a test test uh, bed test bed. Yeah, test bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in fact, because there's there's a couple things in here. Granted, this is being done on a television budget, mm-hmm. they're ha- so they're having to do it a lot cheaper. But you can kind of see where they were uh, testing things that would they would later use in the Muppet movie. Yeah. So, yeah. So like the design of the world, the design of the town, the design of the river. Um, even though, I me mean, like you look at a movie that was created in the late seventies. And you look at it from a 21st century mm-hmm. viewpoint, it's like, man, this looks so cheap. Well, it was cheap because, like you said, they had a limited budget. Yeah. And it was a TV budget. It was a TV special. But and they still, they, 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 there's a lot of marionette, marionette oh, yeah. in here. A lot Absolutely. more than I thought there would be. Yeah. A lot of marionetting. And uh, I think it's one of the, like, the big things that, uh, according to the special, that was one of the big things that uh, had never really been done before that they would use, like, large scale married like marionetting and then puppetry mm-hmm. in the same way. And uh you can definitely know they're in a budget because they didn't they couldn't delete the uh or remove the lines or anything. Yeah. The 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 control sticks. The control sticks and the lines and the whole bit. But uh overall be like I love the des- the design of it. It's just like you have this it it definitely when you pull into the the Muppet part part of the world and uh be like all the details of the home, the river, uh, mm-hmm. like everything. Be like it has this very grounded look about it. it it's it's not fantasy, like like no like fantasy or anything. Yeah. It's just grounded in reality, and it has this, like it has a gloom to it, but it has a charm to it. Yeah. So yeah, the the design of the world, I thought I thought it was very cozy in a way, gloomy but cozy. Mm-hmm. 
What is your number three? I like the relationship between Ma and Emmett. Yes. Agreed. And granted, you got the rest of the band that are helping out in that last, mm-hmm. in that song, but yeah, that relationship between Ma and Grant, it's a mother and son relationship, Grant, yeah. and it's done very well, but honestly, it, it never feels like, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, there's a lot of times when you watch, see a relationship like this on television mm-hmm. and in movies where the mother is overbearing, right. overprotective. The kid yeah. is trying to, uh, you know, break rebel, free. break free, that sort of thing. And that's not what we're seeing here. No, no they are both are very respectful of the, the other one's abilities yeah. and understanding of uh, each other's feelings that they, they never really, they actually feel like a family, which yeah. is a strange thing to appreciate. But let's face it, there's a lot of stuff nowadays even back when this was being made in which family was Agreed. not something you usually saw because yeah. but family's not funny. Family's not dramatic. Yeah. Ironically, because I think some of the most dramatic moments I can remember of my life dealt with family members. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, the, you, you never see that. Now. And this is, it's so, it's so heartwarming just just mm-hmm. to see a a, a family a familial relationship where it's like they're not trying to kill each other and having to learn that being with a family is a good thing. Right. They that's not what they're having to learn here. Mm-hmm. What they're having to learn is you sometimes have to step out and take a leap of faith. True. That's what they're going with. I mean, that's and 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 I appreciate. He admittedly, a gift of the Magi, which is what you know, like I said, I've said a hundred times already, is what this is kind of based on. Yes. Normally, between a uh, a a boyfriend girlfriend situation, mm-hmm. or a husband and wife. Yeah, this is between mother and son. They both want to do something special for the other for Christmas, mm-hmm. even though the only way they know to do it would actually cause harm for them in the long run. Mm-hmm. And it's almost counterintuitive to what you would think you would need to do. Mm-hmm. Putting a hole in the wash is going to mean that she's not going to be able to, to 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 clean laundry as well. So, yeah, you know, pawning uh, Emmett's dad's tools mm-hmm. is going to mean Emmett's going to have a is not going to be able to do as many odd jobs around Frog mm-hmm. Hollow as he used to be able to. Yeah, it. And all you're going to do is be able to put a supposedly a down payment on a piano or buy a used guitar. Yeah. That. So it's almost harming each other. It's all, it's harming to give, give a, to give something yeah. nice. Sacrificial. It's, 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 it's right. It, yeah, but you're sacrificing the other person, which is strange. Yeah, that is. I agree. But what, what I'm, what I'm getting at here yeah. is that's kind of what God asks us to do a lot of times is to step out on faith and do something that. Good point doesn't always make sense when we look at it. Very true. But sometimes you do have to take that leap of faith that because God has a plan and he's going to work it one way or the other. He's going to work it out. Yeah. But sometimes to us, it makes no sense. Oh, oh believe me. I and let, let's face it, making it to where Ma can't do their, do her laundry, which is what where they get a lot of their money from, or make yeah. it where Emmett can't go out and do odd jobs. Right. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't. And 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 you understand why they're hesitant when they're mm-hmm. first thinking about this, Agreed. but they both had to take a, a, a uh, they both had to take a a, a leap of faith. Mm-hmm. And granted, it didn't work out the way they thought it might. Because if it worked out the way they thought it might, yeah, one of them would have won the contest. Right. It wouldn't have been a tie because then they wouldn't have gotten the money probably. Right. And so the fact that it went to the people who didn't care and Mm -hmm. probably didn't care about the money, I'm probably going to spend it on, I don't know, non-alcoholic booze because this is a family thing. It's a Muppet thing. It's a Muppet thing. Uh, They'll they'll go down to the El Slizo Cafe and watch Fozzie Bear. Uh, (laughs) Same time period. Uh, Got it. uh, But, uh, sorry, I just caught myself off guard. Uh, but it didn't work out the way they thought it was going to mm. with that. But the answer 
the, the way it worked, it worked out even better than even if they'd won the 50 bucks. Okay, fair. Because now they've got a lot steadier job than mm-hmm. what they were doing before. Yeah. They're going to pay Far them. Steadier. Hey, not only are they going to get dinner every night that they perform, they're going to get paid. What was it? Like, did they say a dollar amount that Doc Bullfrog was going to pay them for to perform? No, I don't think they mentioned But they're still getting paid regularly. Yeah. Not a fifty dollar one down payment. Even if they're getting only, even if the whole group is only getting paid ten dollars a night, which would still be horrible. Probably more than Doc's going to pay at this time period. Yeah, that's only five days, five nights of performing three or four songs. I'm guessing, or a night's worth of songs, yeah. and they've already made back what they lost in the contest. Yeah, and it also it that also kind of brings up a good point because they it it is a uh, step up in their own yeah. livelihood. Because from it actually ends up being better for them. It does to have lost the competition, Mm -hmm. but then you know just coming together and not performing for you know anybody but their own enjoyment. Basically, right? They happen to get overheard, and now they've all got a great job and free dinner every night. Exactly. (laughs) And they've got mashed potatoes. Hey, be like that's the key point in some bash. I understand, and I understand because mashed potatoes can be good. Yes, but I, I like how this this and granted it's a, it's a Christmas kind of a message, but right. Christmas is Christian in 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 uh you know in most of its traditions. Mm-hmm. It makes sense for it to be, and I appreciate that you know they made they th- these characters had to step out in faith. Mm-hmm. It didn't go the way they thought it would if yep. they because they didn't succeed. But yet it turned out even better than they could have imagined. Yeah, it, it, it turned out more beneficial for them. Yeah, which is, then, granted, that's not always going to happen as Christians. We know this, but mm-hmm. all is going to work out for our good one way or the right. other. God promised that. So I just like that we got, you get this nice visual thing where it's like, right. yeah, it, it, you think it's going to be, it kind of feels like a Deus Ex Machina because they get a happy ending despite they the fact they lost, but yeah, it doesn't feel unearned like most Deus right. Ex Machina endings, yeah. which is why I don't count it as a Deus Ex Machina. Okay. So yeah, that, I, I appreciated that. Okay. So now we need to get into dislikes. Yes. What's your first dislike? My first dislike, uh, watching this for the second time, I started uh, this movie with the now understanding this movie was very heavily didacted. Be like, there were some changes to it. The only changes were Kermit the Frog, uh-huh. uh, his scene at the beginning, and I'm assuming at the end, and the scene at the end were taken yes. out, and Jim Henson's narration as Kermit was taken out. Yes. But th- and that may have helped set things a little better, probably. But honestly, but yeah, that's the only differences that were that were the ch- change. Because yeah. I didn't know this, but that that they were in a, that the town that they were living in was different, but had a different name. I thought that was Waterville. Yeah, didn't realize the other the, the town they were performing in was Waterville. Waterville. Yeah, didn't know the, was the, the community they're in was Froggy Bottom Hollow or whatever it was. Right. But uh, that makes sense because we like. Kermit the Frog and be like that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But um, like the story itself, like the first, like this is a hour long movie with its edits, and like the first twenty minutes, this thing just drags. I mean, like it's a good storytelling, but like the 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 pacing and the story itself mm-hmm. just drags. And like with the music itself, like there again, this kind of music is not my cup of tea, and. Uh, it just be like the the first 15, 20, 25 minutes of this film just dragged by until you got to like the 25 bark. And it's like, oh, it starts getting it starts getting interesting uh visually mm-hmm. because you're using a very generic uh, like your characters just they float by. There's that use of dynamic uh camera angles. Be like, I know in the 70s they could do that. So can I defend? The, okay. the, the, all any of the scenes in the boat, specifically the scenes in the boat. Okay. They were in a boat. Yes. Puppets in a boat yes. in the 1970s. Yes. Underwater. Yes. The actors had to be underwater and to perform a grant. I think it was actually animatronic. Yeah. But still, that they were probably limited in what angles they could shoot I, I, at oh, while I they agree. were doing that. I agree with you. Yes. That, I, I'm not saying you're wrong about feeling that some of that is slow. Yeah. And maybe a little boring. Yes. Or as a, our friend Paul J. Powers.com would say, slow and boring. Mm-hmm. But, exactly. Thanks, Paul. But, but uh, it's technically impressive to me. 
yeah i'll be like you know do not get me wrong be like the the technology they use in this this um special was phenomenal for its time they doing it Mm -hmm. uh i think just looking at it from a 21st century perspective it is a very slow movie it's a very slow movie but i respect what the movie does and i respect the story that they're telling and the limitations they were uh withholding to Mm -hmm. in the creation process uh i just think the story is a bit slow so my first dislike for this, and and I need to be honest, mm-hmm. this being my first viewing mm-hmm. before I did any research, okay, I actually did not have a much wrong with this film. Ah, uh-huh. it's not you know, you know, beat the doors down, best Christmas special. Don't get me wrong, right. but you know, like I said, it's a technically impressive for what they could do in the 1970s mm-hmm. with a TV budget. It looks better than the Muppet Show did, which was being done at the same time. But at the same, but it's, but that's because they're also testing a bunch of things. Yes. I, I'm watching the whole thing. And it's like this is just kind of a cute, sweet story, and I didn't feel like it needed much else. Then I started doing research, and I found out mm-hmm. that a certain green frog mm-hmm. was in this yeah. in all the original versions, and it's because that Disney got sold, uh, mm-hmm. but Disney bought the Muppets and they, and apparently now Jim, Hen- the Jim Henson company could not afford to license Kermit mm-hmm. the frog from Disney, that is, but they had to are. edit Kermit out mm-hmm. of this, which is horribly ironic. Cause you mm-hmm. know, what's interesting about the sale to Disney. What's that? Muppet sale, the Muppet sale to Disney. Mm-hmm. They actually, uh, Jim Henson actually was going to sell the entire company, all of the Jim Henson company to Disney hmm. prior to his death. Yeah. Like he was working on the deal yeah, nice. at, at the time when he, when he passed mm-hmm. and the Jim Henson kids mm-hmm. who took over the company yeah. decided that wasn't a good deal. So they backed out, but they still worked with Disney for Muppet Treasure Island and Muppet mm-hmm. Christmas Carol because they needed somebody to release to. They were willing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then after that, you know, you can see the, other, some of the other Muppet movies go to different companies before it gets, before they all get bought back out. Mm-hmm. There was a time. Now granted, I, I don't like the idea of Disney buying everything, but if we're talking about any perfect world, it would be nice if this was still owned by the same people who owned the Muppets. So you don't have to edit. Sure. That's mostly what I'm getting at here. Don't get me wrong. I don't want Disney owning everything. I think Disney needs to be broke up a little right now. <laughs> if we're being honest. Fair. Let the stuff we wanted, to, we were happy to see Disney buying, like like Fox, for instance. Mm-hmm. I don't like that Disney owns Fox. I am happy now that since Disney owns Lucasfilm, they actually have control of complete control of Star Wars again, the, the releases stuff, so you can buy a box set. Or the fact that the X-Men and... Uh, Fantastic Four and all that is now back under mm-hmm. the, that umbrella, even though Marvel's not doing too hot with its stuff right now either. Or, either, But mm-hmm. I kind of wish they'd sell 20th Century Fox off to somebody else and th- that be a separate company again. Okay. Uh, and I hate the fact that they own the Muppets, not because they, A, Disney doesn't know what to do with the Muppets. Mm. Let's be honest. Yeah, they don't. They really don't. The, the, in fact, I, this is—I don't know if this is in your news today, but the uh, Disney Plus TV show Muppet Mayhem that aired first season earlier this year. Okay. They're not making a second season. Well, that's just sad to hear. Yeah, it's sad to hear because it is, its not performing the way they want to. Now, granted, Muppet Mayhem is the has been considered like the best Muppet TV show since Muppets Tonight back in the nineties. Wow. Okay. It's—it's—it's it's, it has been it was very well received. Received. But it's still not doing good enough for Disney Plus. Well, it's not yeah. much as well. I mean, granted, this is the age of cancel anything that's not doing gangbusters on streaming. True. But they don't know what to do with the Muppets. Mm-hmm. And I kind of wish they would sell the Muppets maybe back to Jim Henson, but then the Jim Henson company is not really like doing as good as they were in the 90s. Well, I think it's every company right now. Every well, yeah, but I mean, if you're talking, you, you don't really see the name Jim Henson on a lot of stuff anymore. No. It's not like the '90s where you're you're watching 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and it's saying work done by the Jim Henson Workshop. And you're going, huh? That's something you didn't expect to see. The guy mm-hmm. making the Muppets making Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, that's just two things that don't go. Now, granted, the Jim Henson Company has done some things that I kind of wish they hadn't have made recently, like Sausage Party. <laughs> They made sausage party. I believe if I'm if if it's not that it was something else that was just as bad. Okay. I, I could be wrong on exactly what I'm it was. Curious. But there was something in the last couple of years that I saw Jim Henson's name on the Jim Henson name on, and I thought, oh, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> but the fact that because of legal reasons, Kermit the Frog had to be edited out of this, mm-hmm. and there was no because there, there would not have been any thought process to allow the footage to remain unedited mm. when, when, when you're looking at legal stuff like we would have preferred. Yeah. And it, admittedly, I'm still kind of uh, not feeling good about any of them because let's face it, even though I'm not a big Sesame Street fan, yeah. Sesame Street's dying too because mm-hmm. HBO doesn't know what to do with Sesame Street. Dang you, Elmo. Uh, you ruined it. <laughs> but at the same I'm just, I, I, as a Muppet fan, I'm annoyed at things the way that Muppets are going, and a lot of that is just personified by the fact that the Jim Henson Company can't have Kermit the Frog in a tell in, in a movie that they made years ago, yeah. and they can't keep him in there for subsequent uh, releases of the video yeah. of of, the, of this thing. That is stupid. Agree. Very, very stupid. That's what I'm trying to get out, get get out. Is like, Fair. I hate the fact that Kermit the Frog was required to be edited out of this. Mm. Not any creative decision by made by. I mean, not because somebody hates Kermit the Frog for some reason. No, legally they had to, and they cannot do anything about it because mm. they probably can't afford to get Kermit the Frog back, even though Disney doesn't know what to do with it either. True. What's your second dislike? My second dislike, uh, this movie, I started losing interest in it very quickly. I mean, like, yeah, it's a good story. Mm-hmm. It's done very well, but it's just, oh, yeah, it's, it's not my style. It's not my flavor of film and uh, like banjos and that kind of stuff. It's just more like the, like whenever the characters would sing, be like, it's like you're, like you understand their plight but at the same time it's just more like okay this is a little boring kind, kind of like a kind of like a child losing interest in something really quickly mm-hmm. that's like me with some things like this movie but like it was good i appreciate what they did but it's just not my it's not my flavor it, it's it, fair enough yeah it, it's got a very mild taste to, for me if we're losing more flavor analogies granted and i kind of this is kind of going to roll into mine a little okay the story is a little bit of weak sauce. Agreed. It's not the bad story. Do not get me no, wrong, but it like it is basically like we keep saying, "Gift of the Magi." Mm. Nothing wrong with Gift of the Magi, but it's been done to death. <laughs> Everyone knows the story. Yeah, agreed. Um, it's got a little twist, yes, and admittedly, the story is it, it can't they can't do a whole lot. First right. off, in 40 minutes to an hour. They still are already doing a lot. And this is kind of the way just these Disney and the, the, the Muppet specials were at this time period. Uh, they were kind of, they were good, but they were very safe, I guess is the word. They're you. not really pushing any envelopes here in terms of story mm-hmm. or writing. Where the envelope is being pushed is in it is is in the actual puppetry, right. which is don't get me wrong, is amazing to watch in this. Mm-hmm. But admittedly, the story is the fr- until they are decide having to decide between. Do I hawk the tools or do or do I put a hole in the wash tub until they get to that point? Yeah. It is very mm-hmm. dry. Agreed. Yeah. That's really what I'm saying. It's it's very dry. It's like we're, we're, yeah, they're setting stuff up, but at the same time, it's like well, this is going nowhere fast. Yeah. And it takes a while for the to get for the story to actually get moving. Yeah. That's does. really what what my issue is. Yeah, is it agreed. takes it takes a while for the story to get moving. Mm-hmm. And then when it does get moving, it goes in a place I kind of saw coming. Yeah. 
it's very predictable. But at the same time, if that's what the book is, how can I complain that they did a good adaptation of the book? Because people apparently like the book, Mm -hmm. which I didn't know there was a book. But anyway, what's your third dislike? My third dislike was more of a a disbelieving disbelief moment it's like a kind of a what in what the moment mm-hmm. is where it's the talent show they're wrapping up and the nightmare parent shows up and be like there again this is a down earth country bumpkin uh <laughs> i know what you're about to say because i have the same problem <laughs> like everybody's playing these junk band songs yeah. very country very twangy and be like that is the feel of this community and then you have the Nightmare Band show up playing this like, this, like late seventies rock. Yeah, and, and, me, and you're half expecting them to boo them off the exactly, stage. But you get the opposite, and they never do that. <laughs> they, they they get applauded. And everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, it's amazing!" And I'm like, that makes no sense that, for this crowd. This, no, I mean, like it, it's it's a funny little twist here that and like, it makes oh, our, 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 and our, it make, our protagonists are not given yeah what they, well, think and, they and it makes sense because if you really think about it if you're going for the happy ending neither one is going to be a complete uh, of them winning yeah is going to be a complete happy ending because somebody is still going to have issues oh agree agree and my, my point is is like when they announced that oh the nightmare band won i'm like and they're all applauding the whole mm. bit. I'm like, this is an isolated community on a river bottom. If that, anything, the, it should have gone to the guy who stole their barbecue song. Yeah, exactly. Like that makes more sense. Yeah. But like you have this downtown, downtown, down home country feel, and you have this rock band show up. They're like, yeah, it's interesting, but I don't think this this group of Muppets would enjoy that too much. So I I think it's, I find the the fact that the junkyard band or the nightmare band uh, win this is mm-hmm. slightly unbelievable. I, I get I get that it's mm-hmm. not my dislike on this, but yeah, it is kind of weird because I kept thinking there's no way the rock band is going to win this, right? It doesn't make a lot of sense, and they do. It's like maybe this is a more progressive town than I thought they were, <laughs> but. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. my third dislike for this is going to be pause slide of all things. Not pause slide. Yeah, at r- right when they oh, are right, making right, the decision, right, right. they yeah. race out to pause slide because it should be uh, good enough now to, to 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 use now that the river's frozen. Right. Right. My problem isn't that the slide exists. My problem is that it obviously looks like. Uh, clear plastic sitting on top of like a black uh what do you call that cloth that that you put plants on top of oh yeah yeah, yeah. it it looks like that more than anything else it looks like it looks like someone threw a a cargo blanket out on this little field cut into a strip of a slide and i'm going I don't think that's how an otter slide would look. Yeah. It's it's a silly little thing. I will grant yeah. you. But I look, I looked at that and thought that's, that's what prob- Paul left you? That's it's like that's not even I, I was expecting something made made out of like uh uh I, I don't know, straw and kind of hollowed out nice, not looking like someone threw a cargo blanket on the ground. <laughs> I get it. I get it. it, it I, I grant it. It's a silly thing. It's just it didn't look I got you. right to me. And the and the more I think back on that scene, mm-hmm. their thing is about going to the slide is it's now cold enough that the slide should be usable. Yes. They're otters. They are otters. Otters swim. Yes. That slide was usable all year round. It just means they probably have to sw- change into their otter trunks before they went into the water. Because these true. are civilized otters, they'd wear swim trunks. That is true. Not that I want to see my otter in a one piece. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. Very much. You are so welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but yeah, that, you can project that right in your face. That, your head. that, that, that I agree. It's a nitpick. Yeah. But it's just, it, it was just like I, a three, three or four seconds there. It's like, I get that this is showing a simple joy that these two have. And 
got, brings back family memories. I know that's what this is, but that doesn't look like what I would expect an otter sign to look like. <laughs> it doesn't look like a it doesn't look natural b it doesn't look like something they would have made out of with tools either no it, what, it, it looked like i said it looks like someone took a cargo blanket and I put it on the ground what, what it looks like to me it looks a like a slip and slide it, yeah for a slip and slide it looks like someone like you would do like in a youth you know youth of, yeah you would take like you know some plastic and just tape it down that's what it, it looks, looks like, like it's, it's embedded into the ground He's like when they said be like, oh, let's go, to, you know, to paw slide. I'm thinking something like maybe made of metal, made of wood, yeah, or something like something that, that would make sense. That would be more robust. Mm -hmm. I was even I, something carved into the the, the, the well, side of the river. Well, I can see something carved into the side of the river bed, but this is and but this doesn't look like this looks like it was injection molded, not. Yeah, at best, it looks like injection. Molding. I, maybe a a uh, and not even good injection molding. This thing was not smooth at all. No. I, I, if it was a metal slide embedded into the into the riverbank, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just this thing looked weird, and it, it's fair. I think it could that could have been handled better. Okay, fair enough. That's mostly what I'm getting at. So yeah, that brings me that brings us to the end of our. Yes. Likes and dislikes for this. What are you rating this special? Uh, even though, like, I do have some slight issues with the store, with you know the the entire thing itself. Um, it's still charming. It's so well done. Uh, it again has this uh kind of class about it mm -hmm. with a an experimental bed towards future projects for the Henson Henson, Henson Company. It just, I mean, like it, I mean, like it's deserving to be like, it's you know, to me, it's getting a seven. Like it has the charm. It has the, the, uh, the, the family feel, mm -hmm. family, uh, centricity about it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, I find it very charming. I find this movie very charming, even though I, it may not be its environment may not be my cup of tea. The story itself compels it or impels impels it compels it to be a seven okay yeah so what is what are you running it i'm giving it a 7.5 okay this is a very simple and a movie I, it, like if we were reviewing this on the retro rewind podcast this would be a nostalgic okay it's not bad it's not something yeah. i'm going to go back and rewatch a hundred times right but it was good for what it was it was enjoyable i think I've, there are better Christmas specials. There are better Muppet Christmas specials oh, than than this one, but this is not a bad one. Don't no. get me wrong. No. Uh, so yeah, I'm giving this a seven point five. If and most of that is going down to the technical, uh, mm -hmm. it, uh the technical stuff in this because yeah. there's a lot of technically tough stuff that they were they did in this that I am still amazed by for 1970s television puppetry. Yes. I can't stress that enough. It, this is going to be amazing. This is the, what they do here is amazing. Two years later, when they do it in the Muppet movie, yeah. and they're doing it here mm -hmm. on far less budget. Yeah. So yeah, and, and plus, don't get me wrong. If you enjoy this, yeah. don't let what we're saying deter you from enjoying this on a regular basis. I just don't. I, I did not watch this one enough as a kid to make it a tradition. Like like have like have nostalgia for the film or something. Right. Like I don't have childhood nostalgia for this film. Yeah. So, I enjoyed what I saw. Yes. But there are other Christmas films that I have more to, I have more love for. Yeah. Be like for me. Be like I would. I would gladly recommend the film. I mean, like if it's one of those films, be it like it's nostalgia for you mm -hmm. that it's a a a yearly watch for you. By all means, yeah. do that. Uh, for me, I never had it. I never watched it. I never heard of it until a couple of years ago. And I'd be like, yeah, it's nice. And be like, uh, might put it on uh, at some point later uh, in, the, in, the, uh -huh. in 2024. And be like, oh, that would okay. be next year. Yes. That would make it a yearly watch in that instance. Maybe. <laughs> By that point, I'll be married. <laughs> Things may be different. <laughs> Maybe. You never know. Your outlook could have completely changed by that point. Exactly. But anyway, uh, yeah. So that's our thoughts on Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. Uh, next week, correct me if I'm wrong, but we did have to slightly reschedule next week, right? 
Uh, for the live show? Yeah. Because next yes. week is the ninth. Ninth. Yeah. I think we're gonna the, we're gonna shoot for we're shooting for the eleventh. Yeah, we're shooting for the eleventh. Okay. Yeah. On the eleventh, we're going to be reviewing 2017's The Star. So join us next. Uh, oh, yeah, and I pretty much next week for that. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, we're going to jump into the intermission. On the other side, we'll talk about what we've been watching, uh, what's in the news, and starting a new trip through a new and or a new ish. New for us, new for me, new for you, <laughs> animated man. series. Mm-hmm. With so, yeah, join us on the other side for that. This podcast is a proud member of Culture Box. Whether you enjoy geeky reviews, comedy, or original fiction, you can open up the Culture Box and find something excellent for your soul. Point your web browser to culturebox.media. This week, we suggest checking out The Rushmore Show. The Rushmore Show is a place for ranking the ultimate top four in sports, video games, nostalgia, movies, and so much more. Each week, Andy and Kirk spark engaging discussions and friendly debates, making The Rushmore Show your compass in the realm of pop culture rankings. You can find more at youtube.com slash The Rushmore Show, where it's all about your top four and nothing more. Cellcast would also like to thank the following patrons. Ashley and Francisco Ruiz, Book of Gaming, PaulJPowers.com, and Edwin Gonzalez. To get your name listed on the show, uh, uncut episodes of the podcast, special art from Jacob, and in my mind there's something else, and I can't figure what it is. Pardon me. Uh, so go donate to us on Patreon for all that. So, Jacob, I have a question for you. Yes. What have you been watching? Oh, so what have I been watching? Well, first, I want to ask you a question. Okay. How was your turkey day or Thanksgiving? I had a good Thanksgiving. Good. Did you eat a lot of turkey? (laughs) Actually, we did not have turkey. What? (laughs) We had a ham. Oh, okay. Not not my favorite for Thanksgiving. And uh, cheesy potatoes and uh, some... uh, Bacon grill, bacon green beans, bacon fried green beans. Okay, I keep hearing things about those. Oh, those are good. <laughs> and uh, crescent rolls, crescent rolls, and blackberry. Well, it's it was a blackberry strawberry cobbler mixture. Oh, uh, okay. That my mom made up. Oh, uh, okay. And there was a cranberry bread. Okay. Of of some kind. I can't remember exactly what was in it, but me, my, my me mom made that. I got gotcha. you. So yeah. Uh, so my Thanksgiving was me, my fiance and her mother drove to my parents' place and had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. I learned that I do not like zucchini whatsoever. How did you have it before I make suggestions? It was in a, um, oh, come on. Why am I flaking on that? Um, was it pan fried? Was I, it steamed? No, it was in a oh, dressing. It was in dressing. Okay, uh, I will. S- you say you don't like it whatsoever. No, I don't. I don't. Like, I didn't like the taste of it. It just right. it was so. Just, I, I still would say that. Uh, do you like fried squash? Never had fried squash. Then you can't answer that question. Exactly. Uh, but I would say fried squash and uh, fried zucchini because it's kind of the same difference. Uh, is very good. Okay, that's my suggestion. Of course, definitely have your ketchup on hand for dipping. Or ranch. or ranch or ranch or ranch either one yes okay i said ketchup for you because i know you like your ketchup i do like my ketchup which is ironic because you don't like tomatoes i do like tomatoes which is not but somebody else who didn't like tomatoes yeah you were you were the was it potatoes that you didn't like or was I, there a, i love potatoes and i don't know what i'm thinking of uh, I, I i like tomatoes to an extent i don't like just like a big fat tomato i like Little bits of tomato, tomato here. Okay. 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 So we got that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so what have I been watching? Yes. yes. Okay. So I was dog sitting while on uh, Thanksgiving break. So you saw a dog. I saw two dogs. You watched two dogs. I watched two dogs. And not much else. I'm kidding. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I watched uh, a little show on that people in the nerdy community has already watched. And probably you're like, Jacob, why in the world did you even watch this? Because I don't have the pro, I don't have the the uh, service the, the description to this. Uh, and I watched Invincible season one. Oh, I think I, I haven't had, watched like, that. 
So don't feel bad. No, okay, good. I'm not the only one then. Well, I know of the show. Yeah. Because I remember when the comic book came out and everyone mm-hmm. talking about it. I didn't read the comic book either. Yeah. But I don't know. The idea of evil Superman just didn't appeal to me. Oh, okay. But uh I really enjoyed it because it did be like it it took be like it took that really, really gritty, be like very violent, very bloody uh storytelling but did it in a way where it wasn't um if you ever watched like i watched one episode of harley quinn on now max mm-hmm. and absolutely hated it because it was way too much of oh we're just gonna push the gore and everything into your face right and i just i couldn't handle it with this they tell a compelling story of mark who is coming into age he learns that he has powers and mm-hmm. uh, that he uses them to protect his city and uh you have this great undertone of a our uh undergirth of a story that's developing mm-hmm. by the end of episode one we know what happened the story unfolds itself throughout throughout the se- throughout season one and it's just done incredibly well i'm like wow this is intriguing but like yeah it's got language yes it has a extremely violent extremely bloody mm-hmm. uh but like yeah if you're more be like you don't like seeing like extreme graphic gore and blood and violence maybe not the show for you mm-hmm. but overall i enjoyed it i want to finish season one i know season two is out already and uh i would love to finish that and the comics seem to be a little intriguing to me so i might dabble in that at some point Okay. Uh, other than that, um, nothing really worth mentioning. <laughs> Let's be honest. Right. Uh, other than that, just like YouTube and uh, yeah. So that's all I've been watching. Well, I've been watching quite a lot. Oh, okay. And probably playing a lot. Actually, more watch than play. Really? Because, you know, we were, I was gone for that's four or five days. Uh, so while I was visiting my parents, yes, I watched, uh, two movies with them. Uh, one was a movie called whistling in the dark, which is a red skeleton movie. Oh, okay. And it's about this, uh, actor, this actor on a, uh, old radio show. Okay. Uh, because he, comes up with these he also does the writing for it and so he comes up with these crimes it's a a crime show yeah so he comes up with the crime and then his character has to solve the crime got it and this cult apparently thinks they can trick him trick him into making them making for them a scheme in order to actually kill a guy wow because they're not going to do it themselves and so they kidnap him his agent slash no no sorry it wasn't his agent his actual girlfriend, his his ah. actual girlfriend, the and the girl who wants to be his girlfriend and is also the uh, sponsor's daughter, ah. kidnaps all three of them, and they have to figure out a way to get out of there. Plus, after he actually does come up with a way to take out the guy, because that was the only thing right. he had to do something to keep them yeah. to keep them from uh, doing anything horrible, um, and they he they have to then come up with a way in order to keep the guy that they're trying that, that he wrote this thing up so they could kill him, keep him from getting killed, despite the fact he's on an airplane. Oh, wow. And granted, the movie is ridiculous. Of course. But it's the fun kind of ridiculous. I got you. And at the end, it's like, this can't get any crazier. And then it kind of does. <laughs> it's a, It was just a fun movie. He's got apparently you. got a lot of these little of these shows and this whistling movies in this whistling series yeah only got to see the one at the time but it was very funny and i enjoyed it nice and then later that uh i don't know if it was that same night or the next day we watched a film called spencer's mountain okay do you know the television show the waltons i've heard of it yes okay so the same guy okay. who wrote the Walton, the, the the book the waltons is based on also mm-hmm. wrote the, uh, the book called spencer's mountain which is very similar stories okay i mean I, they, they are different. I mean, Spencer's Mountain is on the Rockies, mm-hmm. while Walton's Mountain was in the Appalachians. Okay. Uh, but you're still dealing with a poor man, got a big family, mm-hmm. wants to do best by his son, who is a prodigy. Mm-hmm. 
and he's not just the first kid who's graduated from high school. He's the first uh, in the family. He's also the first one who might actually make it in college. Oh, yeah. But things don't work as yeah. well as you'd like. And, and there's a lot, I actually do suggest it because it take as it was actually a very good, a good film. It was a little predictable in some spots, okay. but it was still a very fun watch and it was still touching. Okay. In a couple places. So yeah, that's I, I watch those films. Okay. Uh as you can probably guess, I've been watching more Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Of course. Godzilla yeah. showed up in episode three. <laughs> and you will probably wee. I knew what was happening when I saw the words Bikini Atoll, nineteen fifty two. Oh, and I'm God, going I'm... Oh, <laughs> g-man about to show up because that's the only reason you say those words you put those words on screen g-man g-man godzilla oh, okay i thought it would be like g-man like he's a monster i have heard everyone call him g-man when g-man. referring okay. to it short but yeah godzilla was about to show up and he does <laughs> then gets his mouth blown off anyway wow. by an atomic bomb so he doesn't really blow you know what i mean yeah i gotcha i gotcha uh so yeah that happened so you did you haven't watched the uh, i watched well, episode four no no no. be like so you haven't watched uh godzilla something zero minus one minus one that's it minus one i will be watching that tomorrow oh okay gotcha. times table didn't work out to do it before then and Roger. that's when we planned to do it so gotcha. and i'm seeing it in imax oh fun yeah well, let us know in the next show. Definitely will. But uh, yeah, uh, other than that, uh, I think that's pretty much everything that okay. I've been watching. Okay. So what do we have in the news? Okay. The Cell Cast News with your host, Jacob Heron. I'll admit I f- kind of forgot until I was halfway through the word news that I played audio there. It's all good. <laughs> all right. Why well, thank you, Dila, and getting into the news. Uh, this movie that I had never heard of, uh, it's a new project. They just started, they just announced. Uh, it's called The Jesus Film Project. And the Promise Entertainment has announced a new animated take on the 1979 motion picture Jesus, slated for global release in 2025, utilizing state-of-the-art animation te- animation techniques. The project combines the talents of entertainment industry industry veterans and experience of ar- um, experience of ar- archaeology and theological to transport audiences back to, to Jesus' time. So that's basically all we have. They they go into like who's who's behind it, who's this mm-hmm. and this. But yeah, apparently this they're doing an animated movie over a 1979 special that was came out in the 70s. It's just like okay, that looks interesting. Okay. Yeah. So this one's a little lengthy, so bear with me. Uh, the first five day, the first five Thanksgiving holiday period is always a popular movie going experience for families seeking, seeking out, uh, seeking out animated fair. Mm-hmm. This weekend was no exception with Disney's 60, 63rd anime feature wish and DreamWorks animations 47th title trolls band together uh, splitting audiences landing at number two and number three spots on the box office charts during the five-day holiday weekend. Disney's Wish was the subject of much anal- much uh, analytics by by the trades, billing at, billed as the studio's 100th an- 100th anniversary tenth pole movie. The film was somewhat unfairly judged by critics. Uh, 
who categorize it as too much of a retread of past anime's obsessions with a plucky heroine and adorable sidekicks. The film earned a, res a respectable A minus from Cinescores. The sun scores for audiences despite its total 50 percent on rotten tomatoes by the critics deadline uh deadline deadline is estimating a total of three point or 32.3 million dollars uh box office for the film's first five day run are in 3,900 theaters overseas the movie took in about 17.3 million in 27 markets, uh, bringing the film to a total of $48 million in a five day span. That is not good. No. Yeah, Disney is not doing well. They've not had much luck this year. Yeah, or in the past few years, let's say that. Well, I mean, the last thing that I think we can both claim hit it out of the ballpark mm -hmm. for them was frozen two. Yeah. Frozen two. Yeah. But agreed. that's because that was before COVID and yeah. there is something to be said about the way Hollywood has been releasing movies since that point True. where they are kind of shooting themselves in the foot. Agreed. Agreed. And I think the, this the, is the not much different. One. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Granted, in going off of what the that one critic said that you mentioned, where it's retreading like yeah. old tropes, mm -hmm. I would kind of think you would want something playing towards the old tropes in a hundredth anniversary you project. Yeah, as long as it's done well. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. So DreamWorks Trolls Ben Together sits at the number four spot with the. Uh, with a five day total of $25.3 million, million dollars in overall. That isn't the way that's supposed to be spelled. Uh, come of six point sixty eight four uh sixty four point four million dollars since it's November 17th release in 3,893 theaters statewide the movie has made over 81 million dollars overseas with a worldwide overall gross of 15 or 154 million dollars um uh in industry observers predict that the popular um uh predicted the popular trick trickle directed by walt Dur uh, Dorf will surpass the $150 million uh, breach mark in a few days. Uh, the Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbird and Snakes is the number one with $42 million in the five-day run. And Apple's Napoleon lands at number two with $32 million in the same frame rate. Uh, both films face more competition with universal Ill, uh, illuminations migration movie when it comes out um, comes out on December 22nd at the same time streaming like stream streamers like Netflix is offering solid alternatives to theater fairs with the Adam Sandler voice Florida lizard movie Leo which is is set setting might uh setting mightily on the top of Netflix's movie charts this week. Other animated movies on the streaming must watch US charts include Illuminations and Minions at number four, Spy uh Sony Spider Man Across the Spider Verse at number eight, and Dreamers Trolls at number ten. Uh that is all I have for in the news. Unless you have something else. I do not it is hard to believe that DreamWorks is at movie. I'm assuming this is DreamWorks Animation specifically, uh -huh. but they're at movie 47. They're only 20 movies behind Disney right now. Well, let me uh, double check that. Because you said Wish was 67. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, like Disney's 60, 63rd in, uh, animated right. feature. 
Disney's 63rd. So and it's DreamWorks Animation's 47th. So 47 versus 63. That's 15. Yeah. There are only 15 movies behind Disney. Yes. And yet DreamWorks has only existed since the 90s. Yes. They have been putting out a lot of stuff. That's all I'm saying. Yes. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that. That's the part that I think amazed me most of that is because yes. I don't frankly care about Trolls 3. Yeah, me either. And Wish is kind of a, eh, I'll see it when it comes out on yeah. Disney+. Plus. I'm not really, this is not something I want to go to a movie theater to see unless we ended up doing a reaction, but our schedules did not work yeah. for that this year, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely run the, 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 uh, between Hol- Thanksgiving and Christmas is yeah. always going to be hectic. The, the holiday trifecta. Of yeah. Holidays. So we'll try for some more movies, of course, next year for reactions. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and jump into something you have been looking forward to probably all day. Yeah. Uh, if not all week. All week. Let's say that. <laughs> because in many ways, this was your choice. Yes. For was. our next animated series, even uh, though we just did come up in the vote. And we did other things first. This was the next thing on that vote. Uh-huh. Let's get into talking about Neon Genesis Evangelion. Card captors, a mystic adventure. Card captors, a quest for all time. I have been sitting on that for a week. Yes. <laughs> for those of you who don't know what any of that was, those were all the American English names for many of our favorite animes, both mine and Jacob's. Started off with Rock the Dragon from Dragon Ball Z. Yes. Then went into the theme to Card Captors. Yes. Not Card Captor Sakura. Card Captors. Card Captors. And then uh, Sailor Moon, Moon, of course. And then Pokemon. Yes. Because you got to have Pokemon. It's the 90s anime everyone yes. fell in love with. Yes. Uh, and then I thought it was funny since I knew Digimon had to go on there next. Because, yes, hey, your show, B, they were the two fighting at the time. Yes. So I thought it was funny that Pokemon have to do 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 Digimon. <laughs> Which, of course, Yu-Gi-Oh! in between there. Yes. And then that one piece rap. Oh, gosh. <laughs> From the four kids. From the four kids, <laughs> which leads right into the four, lost four kids <laughs> opening to Evangelion, which is not actually a lost four kids opening. It was a, it was a video uh, uh, audio. Yeah, it was a video spoof. I don't have the guy's name. I saw it on YouTube. You look for the lost four kids, four kids Evangelion uh, yeah. dub. You will find it. Yeah, go look that up. It's absolutely hysterical. Yeah. So, it was probably um, more in the, and of course we end with Girl Angel's thesis. Yes. Except there's one last little thing yes. I put on there. And I thank Dallas Panda Marshall Mora for this because every time I brought up we were doing Evangelion, he said there's only one thing I have to say. Emotional damage. And I had to find that clip somewhere. <laughs> And I don't remember this guy's name, but he is funny. Yes. I will say that. I, yes. I will make sure I have all this information yes. next time because yes. now I'm feeling horrible that I can't quote these people. But yeah, we are starting our review of Neon Genesis Evangelion, our first anime TV show yes. uh, to do on this. And also, the first thing we're reviewing that's not based on something else. That is true. In an animated series thing. So, be- be- before you move, 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 move forward, uh, I just had to do that because the, yeah. the, the, the Yu-Gi-Oh thing. 
So I, I gotta give you props. That was done very well. Props, just yeah, that was awesome. Especially since that was my second go. Yeah, and you didn't like my first well, one. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say I didn't like it. It was just, like you it was a, a it was a first take, and it was a it wasn't as funny as my original vision was. Yeah. So my, and that was mostly because well. that four kids opening, lost four kids opening of Evangelion was. Mm-hmm different than every other version true and i couldn't edit it in very well but anyway yeah so yeah we're starting neon genesis evangelion this is a long-running anime franchise believe it or not uh starting with of course we've got this anime Mm -hmm. then there was a two movie sequel Mm -hmm. one being uh the movie death and rebirth the Death half is a recap of the whole series, yeah. while the rebirth Earth half is eventually the- becomes the first third of the uh-huh. second movie, which is the end of the Evangelion. Evangelion. And then, got which, is, that. which is a alternate ending mm-hmm. to the show because apparently, no one, a lot of people did not like the ending they of this didn't. show. They didn't. <laughs> And, and the then was like, okay, you then, want an ending. Okay, then there ending. is a edit of both of those films uh-huh. edited together as revival of Evangelion, really? which edits the films together. Really? So if you want to watch the whole thing in one go, good, bad, salty, whatever, all 26, as they word these things, all 26 episodes, uh-huh. That's apparently the way to go, is you could probably do that in about three hours. Wow. Which, considering what a little I know of the show, that's going to be a very emotionally draining three hours. Yeah, your, your, your mental health might get sh- a, a good shock to it. Yeah. Also, there is the rebuild of Evangelion series of films, which, uh-huh. starting with 1.0, you can not advance. 2.0, you can... Sorry, I said that wrong. You you, you, 1.0 is you are not you alone. Are, yeah, you're not 2. alone. 2.0 is you can not advance. advance. 3.0 is you can not redo. Mm-hmm. And the reason I'm saying not is in the way I'm doing that mm-hmm. is because those are in parentheses. Mm-hmm. Because one thing you will quickly learn about Evangelion is mm-hmm. it loves double titles. It does. Which is great for the next one. 3.0 plus 1.0, Thrice Upon a Time, whose Japanese title, and then the title that's written in the Japanese language, uh-huh. is Shin Evangelion Theatrical Edition. And Shin Evangelion is part of the Shin Strap Japan superhero thing that Hideki Anno has really? been doing over in Japan, which includes Shin Godzilla, hmm. Shin Ultraman, and Shin Kamen Rider, or as you'll find it when you go through Amazon now, Shin Master Rider. Wow. It is all part of this marketing thing that he he was doing with all these really? same movies that all had the word Shin in them. Really? Mm-hmm. That is interesting. Also, fun fact. Uh, Shin is actually in the Japanese title of the show. Yes. So we'll get to that in a minute. Yes. Quick history, though, because I'll be honest, I put a little more work into this than normal because you pulled an eight. (laughs) I did pull an eight. But the the reason I put some more work into this is because, A, I can't assume you like when when we started Mm X-Men, I kind of assumed you knew what X-Men was. Yes. When we did Tangled, I assumed you'd listen to our review at least. Uh When we did Thundercats. We probably should have done more explaining. <laughs> yes. It's Thundercats. It's Thundercats. But doing this is like, this is easily the strangest, the, the, the most original thing. Yeah. What's the strangest, most original thing we've done. And strange. It is strange. But before I guess I get into that quick history, I should be nice and ask you to tell us, what is this thing about? Okay. So because y- this is definitely your pick. Yeah. This is something I've tried to watch a couple of times. But I never could see why it's, but it's kind of hard never to do never could get into. Yeah, you know what this whole thing is about. Tell us what this whole thing is about. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. The same be like, oh, I know the entire like the, this and the, this and this and this. I don't know all that, but I've enjoyed it since I was a lot younger. Uh, so to give equipment with synopsis, I actually found this and I thought it was a very good synopsis of the of this uh, show. A <clears throat> apocalyptic mecha action story which revolved around the efforts by a paramilitary group organization called nerve to fight a hostile being called angels using giant humanoid robot humanoid creatures called evangelions where they are piloted by select teenagers 
the uh, psychology, religious, and philosophy of themes explored in this work present a per, present repres, uh, represent the majority of the discussion of this show. Okay, yeah, that, that kind of wraps it up a little bit, so, so it doesn't give you like this enormous like. Oh, because we are going to have we'll be digesting this over oh, the course of the next three months. Yes, because there's a lot. If there, if there is one thing everybody can agree on, whether yeah. you like Evangelion yes. or not, yes. this is very pretentious <laughs> and it's filled with symbolism. And he's trying to say something. Yeah, even though in some cases he's not saying what we, as an American, we think he's saying, but it's what I understand. What I understand is because I have seen so many people review Evangelion and try to explain mm -hmm. it where you have where over in Japan they would use uh, Christian iconography yeah. and symbols and the whole bit because over there it doesn't mean anything to them as much, or it doesn't as mean much. the same thing it doesn't mean the same thing to, as, as like Americans who believe in Jesus uh, so as Americans we view it completely different what the, the original right. religion was but uh, overall be like it's this is a very heavy, very dense show. Yeah, and I know and a lot of people love it, and others are like, "I do not like this. I thought it was stupid." But and that's why we can definitely say it's pretentious because people who like it, mm -hmm. they'll say it's pretentious, but because it's, they'll say it's because it's got art. It's it's very artful. It's yeah. very full of all the stuff. Whereas those people who don't like it, uh -huh. they'll say it's pretentious because just like the word pretentious actually means, mm -hmm. they feel it's presenting itself as more important mm -hmm. than it actually is. Yeah, agree. And probably it's a little of both. It is a little of both. Uh, so, so sorry, go ahead. So for me, like watching this, I found I found myself drawn to this when I was uh, probably like an early teenager. Mm -hmm. This came out in 1996, I believe. Uh, I believe that's right. Yeah, I think it was 96, and uh, it was on. I can tell you, production started in 90 uh, or as early as 93. Yeah, 93. Then it came out probably like 94, 95. Let me scroll down to the when the first episode came out. Yeah. Right. 97. 97. Okay, 97. Okay. Because like, I have these so, first aired things on there. So <laughs> yeah, I would have been. I would have been an early teenager. And, and it probably didn't make it over here till 98 or 99. Roughly, about 89 years. Because I was, I was in middle school, high school at that point. Mm -hmm. Or I was in high school already. And I discovered this on uh, Toonami. I, I'm assuming it was either, it, maybe not Toonami itself, because I think Toonami was still a daytime show. Yeah. Then this may have been late night Adult Swim. Maybe. Around the same block of when they were originally showing Cowboy Bebop and Possibly. Outlaw Star and things Possibly. of that nature. Granted, I never saw this on television. Okay, I don't even remember it being uh, advertised. Okay, so it may have just been I missed it. Okay, fair. But uh, like overall, be like I, I remember watching this, and I remember like watching it maybe for the wrong reasons at the time, because it was like ooh this and this and this and this. And like now, as retrospect as an adult, I'll be like You're catching other things in there. I'm catching other things because it's like, oh, it's mecha fights. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's this. And then now as an adult, I'd be like, oh, I'm catching all the symbolism. I'm catching this. I'm mm -hmm. catching all the Christian iconography they're doing and the Jewish mysticism they're doing. Oh, is there a lot of Jewish mysticism in this? A lot of it. And what uh, little I've come up with just on the research for these two episodes is like, yeah, you're wow, not Wow, you. you people yeah. dug too far. Yeah. Well, they're going to be like... Ad this is worse than when Ultraman revealed he was actually Noah back in the day. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it was one episode. It's like, oh, okay. He was Noah? Why? <laughs> or Noah was an ultra being. Oh, but he was an ultra being. Whether it's okay. the same Ultraman, I don't I know. Gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. But, but it was, um, that was a weird episode. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's just like whenever you watch something from a younger age, be like as an adult, you, uh, you perceive it or... Uh, you tackle it from a different perspective and like watching it now. Cause like when I watched it, then there was a different perspective. I was a lot younger and uh, your, your attention was drawn to other parts of things. Mm -hmm. So now as an adult, be like, you see those parts. I'm like, mm, okay. Now you see it now watching it for this time around, Yeah, this time around. Uh, I have a heavy appreciation of what they're doing story-wise. And uh, I was very fortunate because I bought this set at yeah. Walmart. Now it's worth like 300 and some dollars. Yeah. So a little bit of my history with this. Okay. Granted, I've tried to watch this show three times, <laughs> but let me, let me back up. Uh, 
sometime between when I got out of high school. Okay. And when I went back to college. Okay. I left anime behind for a bit for one reason or another. I guess mm-hmm. maybe I didn't have time or whatever. And as I was coming back, got, was getting back into it, right. I had a list of shows that I wanted. Mm-hmm. This was not quite on that list okay? because <laughs> I think I had heard about it this time, but okay. I knew it was, it was one of those. It's like, if I see it, mm-hmm. might think of picking it up. Right. Cause you get what you can get other shows that were on this were other ADV stuff. Cause by this time ADV was dying. Yeah. And it hadn't quite mutated into Sentai film works yet. Yeah. Uh, so other things would have been like fully Cooly. You couldn't get at the time, yeah, which yeah. I remembered watching that. It's another weird one. It's another weird one. Um, uh quack experimental anime excel saga was one i was looking for yeah. looking for at the time uh a couple other adv classics mm-hmm. that pretty much unless hastings oh, i God. miss hastings oh my unless God. it happened to have it you weren't finding it yeah that's true and so a lot of the the the, the two or three adv dubs i uh, adv animes i still have are because i hastings happened to have it when mm-hmm. i was there uh or Finally, Funimation did a re-release of it, and they used the same dub, which, why not? Uh, So my first introduction Mm -hmm. to Evangelion proper, Mm -hmm. as in the franchise, was actually with the Rebuild movies. Really? I I bought uh, 1.0, or I guess at that point it was 1.11. Yeah, because they did re-release these with like additions, and they changed the numbers, but they're, yeah. they're basically the same movies. Yeah, same movies. Um, but I, I watched with that one, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. Yes, I didn't know. I, I was catching, of course, the Christian iconography. Mm-hmm. I was catching that there was obviously some more deep symbolism in this mm-hmm. than maybe I was initially catching. Yes, and I was still inter- at this point. I had not. I had not. I did not understand at this time how beloved this mm. particular anime yes. was by so much of the yes. anime community. Yes. And so, but I enjoyed it. So when 2.0 came out, no, before 2.0 came out, I actually, and this is going to really age me. I attempted to rent the TV series anime off of Netflix DVD. Really? Yeah. I watched the first disc, Mm -hmm. which contained episodes one through four, I believe. Yeah, I think so. Which is basically the first movie. Uh Uh-huh. Because the first movie is pretty much, it's not a tracing of the the first show, Mm -hmm. first four episodes, but it's not far Mm -hmm. from that. There's a lot of things where you look at and go, that is the same angle. It's just maybe drawn slightly differently. Uh And di- done digitally instead of by hand. Yeah. But basically, it's like it's the same story. Yeah, it is. And it's hitting a lot of the same elements. It could almost be an edit if it weren't in widescreen. Yeah. And I remember thinking, oh, I've already seen this. Mm-hmm. Are these movies in the show the same thing? I thought I read it was different. And so I try. I I for whatever reason took the rest of the d- d- discs off. I was like, well, I'm watching the movies anyway. That'll be uh-huh. fine. Mistake number one. I should have just kept going at the time when I was uh-huh. much more likely exactly. to just want, be able to watch through all these without really caring, without being as finicky as I am now. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to get finicky later in life. Uh-huh. But uh, so then I watched 2.0 and it got weird because 2.0 gets weird. Yeah. That film does. Yes. Uh, and I understand that's where it starts to take it its very, uh, it tangent sh- it from, sh- what, sh- from what the show the very does. The end of it does. I'm like, what the crap? Yeah. Gigi, what the crap are you doing? And then there's that guy on the moon. But yeah, I don't know what that's about. He uh-huh. seemed like he might have been in love. Uh, oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. I, I'm, pop, pop, pop. I'm, guess, I'm guessing that I'm going to have to deal with him again the way yeah. you're reacting. Oh, yeah, you are. You uh, but are. Uh, pop. <laughs> I, I, I watched those and thought, okay, this is weird. And I don't know if I want to continue with the movies. And I'll admit, even Fair. though I own 3.0, yeah. I've never watched it. Oh, okay. I bought it thinking, oh, I'll watch this. And then I never unwrapped it. I the gotcha. shrink wrap. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> and so, uh, and I definitely haven't even tried 3.0 plus 1.0. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that one is a long movie. And then at that point, uh-huh. uh huh. You know, a lot of the stuff just seemed to disappear where you couldn't find it anymore exactly. legally if you wanted to. Yeah. Because 
ADV was gone. Yeah. Most of the stuff got sold into what became Sentai Filmworks, which yes. is basically ADV's child company. Yeah. Except for whatever reason, Evangelion was never re-released through Sentai, so I guess they lost the license or something. Yeah. I know Funimation is the one who did the rebuild films. Yes. But that's because ADV couldn't, and there was yeah. some weird deal that they had. Yeah. For the, that's why the ADV, the, 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 those rebuild films, are actually using the ADV cast. Yeah. And plus, they're all in, fell apart. And plus, they're all in Texas. Yeah. So, and Gynax fell apart was part of that issue. Uh-huh. Exactly. Because after, is it Gurren Lagan was their last show? Uh, I was actually looking at that. I think it's Gurren Lagan or Gurren no, Lagan. However, you say the name of that it's show. Gurren Lagan. I've heard it both ways. That is a good one. Uh, uh, so their their last project was Wish Upon a pla- uh, Playardus. I probably I don't know that one. The yeah, last one I know that too. the last one I know people talked about was Gurren Lagann. Uh, I think the last one people talked about was actually uh, painting stockings with a uh, garter. That don't count that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so Gur- that's, I forget that's technically yeah. Gynax. Oh, but it's you can definitely tell it's Gynax. But it's entirely different uh, than anything True. else they do. Uh, but yeah, Gynax died, uh, pretty much died around that time. And so mm-hmm. pretty much it took a little bit for Studio Kara, who yeah. now is, is Hideki Anno's current company. He's yeah. the main writer for this. Uh-huh. And it took them a bit before they got uh, control of that mm-hmm. back. And then they sold the dub to Netflix. Yes, they did. And I'll get to some of the issues with that here in a second. But one of the big things is, is that's when I tried to watch it again, when the Netflix dub came out Yeah, and I can tell you, I got 10 episodes in. I didn't stop watching because I wasn't enjoying it or wasn't getting something out of it. I stopped watching because I needed to take a break and then I never came back. Mm. Okay. Fair. It, I was, I probably would have finished it then, but you know, stuff got ahead. So mm. yeah, quick history though, before we get too much farther <laughs> into this, because I, I, I have a feeling this is going to go a little long. Uh, a little. In July 1993, production ceased on a film that Guy Nexo was working on at the time yes, called Aoki mm-hmm. Uru, mm-hmm. which Hideki Anno was set to direct. Yeah. Uh, and it died simply because Guy Nex couldn't afford to make it at that yeah, time. Exactly. Uh, at that point, uh, Hideki Anno agreed to a collaboration with King Records, which guaranteed them a time slot for something yeah anything they said just pick whatever you want so it's like hideki Anno was given a blank check yeah pretty much and he was dealing with depression at the time and that's what i'm getting to yeah he was dealing with depression so and he had and he is a big ultraman fan yeah and a fan of a lot of these older Mm -hmm. super superhero tokusatsu stuff and a fan of mecha okay so he made a deconstruction of all these genres plus Uh, shonen anime yeah uh and made it was technically and i'm saying this technically because i already know something because of the end of the first episode that may prove this is not these aren't technically robots but this is technically a super robot show yes in terms of the tropes it uses yes which is different from real robot which is what gundam usually is yes i say usually because g gundam exists and it's yes. not real robot <laughs> anyway wait a minute they're not real robots in g gundam they're super robots because oh, they're... they don't pilot them like they're tanks. Oh, okay. Like gotcha. the other ones do. Okay, gotcha. That's gotcha. basically the difference is a uh, real robot feels more like it would be something we could engineer, yeah, even yeah, if yeah. I gotcha. even if some of the stuff is so fantastical. Uh, you are not making a, well, I guess actually now at the, at the time you weren't going to make something that was using pretty much what we would now call motion capture <laughs> to control your giant robot, but now you could. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, Maybe G, Gundam, maybe G Gundam is now a real and real robot show. Right. Either way, wow. uh, the original early plotline for Evangelion remained stable throughout its development, although later episodes appear to have changed dramatically from the fluid and uncertain early conceptions. For example, originally there were twenty-eight angels, not seventeen. Okay, they cut them down, and the climax would deal with the defeat of the final 12 angels and not with the operation of the human instrumentality project. Yes. Also, the original design for the character who would become Shinji mm. was a schoolboy who could switch to an angel form and he was accompanied by his pet cat. Now you take the pet cat out of this description and you know what you have? Attack on Titan. <laughs> I mean, I read that. But I, they were ahead. Some somebody read that thing and thought we could do that. 
Okay, so that's what I've got for basically the early history of this. There is other things that are going to pop up, but yeah. we'll hit those when we yeah. get to the episodes. Yeah, well, two other things I've got left. Sorry, okay, go ahead. So, kind of for me, like watch like someone who's watched the series completely. Uh, it, it's for me right now. It's kind of like watching when we watch Tangled the series mm-hmm. because there again, you're watching it. I kind of know what's going to happen. You kind of know. I happen. know a couple of things that have been spoiled for me. Ac- oh. uh, in the past, yeah, some of it from the movies, which I know some of that's going to be different. Yeah, some of that from the fact that people don't shut up. Oh, it's, true. <laughs> it's an internet culture. They it's the internet shut. culture. I, I there are. I am still pretty much in the dark for like the very end of this show. Okay. Uh, but the but uh. And there's a lot of details I don't have for okay. the rest of it. But uh-huh. in terms of some of these things, mm-hmm. I may know some things. Okay. I know enough to know that this is going to get very depressing very fast. Uh-huh. But, yeah, we are kind of in that situation of Tangled, the series where you know everything, I know nothing. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. Plus, let's be honest. With all the research I do for this for this uh-huh. segment, I am going to run into stuff from time to oh, time. Yeah, I have already run into a couple of terms, yeah, and looked up what those terms were because <laughs> it's like, what on earth are they talking about with this sentence? And you go, go, oh, I'm not supposed to know that <laughs> yet. <laughs> I'm curious what uh, what term did you run into? LCL, ACL. Okay, LCL, got it. ACL, LCL, LCL. Got it. I looked up what I found out what that was. I now know what the orange juice is, <laughs> <laughs> or I have an idea what the orange juice yeah, is. Exactly. Thankfully, it's a lot cleaner than what I thought it was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, because this is an anime, it's important we talk about the music, uh, yes. the, at least the opening and closing themes for this, because that is a major thing for anime. Yes. The opening theme for this is A Cruel Angel's Thesis, which was oh. written for the show, and was performed by Yoko Takahashi. Uh-huh. The song was written without any involvement from the show's producers. Really? Yeah. The lyricist, Neko Owaima, mm-hmm. had next to no knowledge of the show. Hmm. She simply skimmed through a proposal for the show and watched unfinished versions of these first two episodes on Fast Forward. Wow. Okay, that makes sense. Only serving to broadly fit the anime with the, with, with the, with the song. Okaima described it as the perspective of a mother when her child leaves the nest. Oh, good. The original song also included a male chorus, which was cut at director Hideaki Anno's request Mm -hmm. in order to empathize maternal affection. Oh, that makes sense. The closing thing for this is Fly Me to the Moon. Mm -hmm. Originally, uh, this was a pop standard written by Bart Howard in 1954. Mm -hmm. As and the original title was "In Other Words." Mm-hmm. Uh, Felicia Sanders introduced the song in cabarets. The song became known as "Fly Me to the Moon" from its first line, and after a few years, the publishers changed the title to that officially. Yes, Frank Sinatra included this song on his 1964 album "It Might as Well Be Swing," accompanied by Count Basie. Mm-hmm. Due to it being closely, this became this is the most famous version of this song due to it being associated with NASA's Apollo space program, since it was played on Apollo 10 while orbiting the moon and on Apollo 11 before landing on the moon. Numerous versions of this piece were used with Evangelion Mm. on their laser discs, VHSs, as well as when the show first premiered on television. But for the renewal DVD release, further new versions were produced. Every version, every episode has a different version of fly me to the moon. When you count the differences in length and between the on-air version and the video version and the DVD renewal endings at the end of the disc, it makes a total of 31 different versions Mm -hmm. of the song Fly Me to the Moon. However, those of us who are watching on Netflix, because this is the easiest version to get a hold of at this point in time, will not get to experience this because due to licensing issues, Mm -hmm. The Netflix version does not contain any version of Fly Me to the Moon, whether it be in the end credits or when it was used in its insert songs in parts of episodes. Uh-huh. And in the end credits, it is, it is replaced by a piece of background music from the show titled Ray One. Oh, uh, okay. Which makes sense because Ray's in the background of that scene. Yeah. I do not, could not find any uh, official reason why they decided to not license the, the song mm-hmm. 
my my understanding from all the different places I read is it was hard to find. It was hard for Netflix to get worldwide rights. And I'm guessing not that it was hard to get, but hard to get for the price they wanted to give it, since this was going to be a song that primarily played during the end credits, which, let's face it, Netflix does have a very well-known feature called Skip Credits that pops up at the end Uh and goes automatically when you barely have time to stop it. Yeah. So I guess their thought was, we don't care. This this is going to be something most people aren't going to see. We don't want to really pay the price it's going to cost for us right. to license the song, much less all of the royalties mm-hmm. to every single performer of this song and every different version mm-hmm. for something most people are not going to watch. That's true. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying that's probably the reason why it was a pure gotcha. business decision. I got gotcha. you. Uh, but that's also not an official reason, nor is it confirmed. That is a guess on my part. Mm. As I mentioned before, each episode has two names. Mm hmm. One in Japanese and one in English. These names do not translate to each other hmm. most of the time. Okay. I say most of the time because I'm going to immediately contradict myself with the first episode. Okay. Um, even the name of the series does this. Uh-huh. Because Neon Genesis Evangelion is the English title, which is yes. ironic because none of those three words are English. No. <laughs> and the, Jap- but the Japanese Japanese. title, mm-hmm. Shinseki Evangelion, mm-hmm means when you translate it into English as a new century, Evangelion. Uh. The word Evangelion mm-hmm. is Latin mm-hmm. for good news. It is actually the word used by the early Christian church yes. that we now use at, at that we now use the term gospel. Yes. As gospel is an old English word basically having its root in the word Evangelion. Mm-hmm. So literally, while the Japanese name mm-hmm. could translate out to uh, the gospel of the new century, mm-hmm. the English name would translate out to the beginning of a shiny new gospel. Yeah. Which considering the, the, what <laughs> all the Christian iconography and all this other stuff in here is like, man, Hideki Yano, you were just crazy at this point, weren't you? Yeah. It's like, Oh, let's just use this and this. We have no idea what it means. Um, and then us over here who are Christian, it's like, what the crap? <laughs> so, yeah, that is what I have for the show's introduction. Oh, wow. Yeah. Let's get into the first episode. Okay. Angel Attack. Angel Attack, which is both the name of the English and the Japanese. This is the only episode where it's the same name. Really? Yes. This episode was first aired on August 20th, 1997, mm-hmm. directed by Kazuya Surumaki and written, of course, by Hideki Yano. Oh. The summary for this episode, Shinji Ikari, a 14-year-old boy in the city of Tokyo 3, mm-hmm. is delivered to the secret organization Nerve, where he is requested by his enigmatic father to save the city from an invading creature called an angel. Mm-hmm. Now, because this is the first episode, yes. we have a lot of cast members. Yes. And because there are four dubs of this, yes. counting the original Japanese, it's going to take me a bit to get through this cast list. Okay, so before that, we like let our audience know yeah. that we are actually... You watch the, you watch the uh, director's cut, yes. of it, the ADD director's cut version. Yes. I watch the Netflix dub. Yes. I am going to go over all of them. Uh, because okay. honestly, if, I got, if you get someone out there who preferred the original adv dub you got someone who's just watching it in japanese yeah you might as well we might as well touch on all of it so shinji akari in the japanese version was voiced by megumi ogata spike spencer in the adv dub Mm -hmm. and casey mongillo in the netflix dub misato katsuragi was voiced by katono mitsushi in the japanese allison keith in the adv and carrie Karenin in the Netflix. By the way, when I'm just saying ADV, that means they were in both the original dub and the director's cut. Got it. When I I will specify when it changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ritsuko Akagi was voiced by Yuriko Yamaguchi in the Japanese, Su Ulu in the ADV, and Erica Linebeck in Netflix. Mm-hmm. Ray Ayanami, who was only in this for a short second, mm-hmm. uh, was voiced by Megumi Hayashibara in the Japanese. Mm-hmm. Amanda Winley in ADV, and Ryan Bartley in Netflix. Gendo Ikari was voiced by Fumihiko Takichi in the Japanese version. 
Tristan Macaveri in the ADV original dub, John Swayze in the ADV director's cut dub, mm. and Ray Chase on Netflix. Which character is this? Gendo. Oh, Gendo Kari. Yeah. Yeah. Kozo Fuyutsuki was voiced by Motomo Kiyokawa in the Japanese, mm-hmm. Gal Lund in the ADV, and J.P. Karliak in the Netflix. Maya Ibuki was voiced by Miki Nag- Nagasawa in the Japanese, Kendra Benham in the ADV original, and Monica Rial in the director's cut, mm-hmm. and then Kristen Marie Cabaneros in the Netflix. Sorry, C- Cabanos. I said the name wrong. Really sad when it was the, in- when it was the Spanish name. That messed me up (laughs) with all these Japanese names. Makoto Hyuga was voiced by Hiroyuki in the Japanese, Matt Greenfield in the ADV, and Daniel M.K. Cohen in the Netflix. Shigeru Aoba was voiced by Takahiro Koyasu in the Japanese, Jason C. Lee in the ADV original dub, Mm -hmm. Vic Mignogna in the ADV director's Uh cut, and Billy Kamitz in the Netflix. (sighs) A lot of people's names. Mm -hmm. Getting into the trivia, the featured angel in this episode Mm -hmm. and in the next episode Mm -hmm. is Mm Sakiel, though it's spelled Mm S-A-C-H-I-E-L. I had to double check a lot of this. So yeah, Tokyo 3, that the cap, the the main setting of this Mm -hmm. is actually southwest of where Tokyo actually is. Okay. Like by like 30, 40 miles. Oh, wow. It is uh, uh, located where the current town of Hakone is. Okay. So that's an interesting little thing. I'm guessing the original Tokyo and probably Tokyo 2. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming there was a 2. Uh, a two. I'm assuming it all got destroyed in the second impact. Yes. It does. Term I haven't used yet, but let's face it, that's going to come up. Although it is never mentioned in the series, a comparison between the tactical map displayed in Central Dogma's Command Center in the episode and maps of the region reveal that the town where Shinji first meets Masato is the city of Atami, which is 25 kilometers away. Hmm. When Shinji hands Masato his summon letter, you can see that the letter was torn to pieces, then taped back together with black tape. Masato makes no comment on this, and is never, it's never officially explained what drove Shinji to break the letter, to, to tear the letter apart, Turn it up. Well, what drove him to repair it? You know, I it think we can sense. kind of make make some assumptions. It makes sense. Yeah, it does With make sense. Character. But I thought that was interesting that that yeah. detail is there, but they don't hit you over the head with it. Yeah, it's it's a very small, mm-hmm. very it, it's comes and gone. But once you get deeper into the story, yeah, be like you it's understand become, why Shinji would tear it up, right? Why he would right refuse it together. While going down the Nerve Headquarters elevator, Misato tells Shinji, I see, so you don't get along with your father. It's the same with me. In response to Shinji's remark that Gendo wouldn't have called him unless he had a use for him. Uh-huh. This is one of the of the many similarities between Shinji and Misato yes. that are noted or established throughout the series. Yes. Misato mailed Shinji a photo of herself to let him know what she looked like when yes. she picked him up. Oh my God. It is highly, in, 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 highly inappropriate photo of her in revealing clothing and posing, winking at Shinji and giving him the P, the V sign. The Japanese writing on it translates to Shinji. It's, mis- it's, it's the character. <laughs> yeah. It translates to, it translates as to Shinji. Uh-huh. I'll be picking you up. So wait for me, okay? Mm-hmm. Masato also punctuated the photo with a highly inappropriate message. Check these out. It's Masato. It's, it's, that's it's, Masato. That's Masato. I can already tell she's going to be interesting. She is. <laughs> Ritsuko tells Masato that the odds of Ava Unit 1 activating are 0. Point, tons of zeros, 9%. Yeah. I'm saying it that way because I don't want to guess how many zeros that is. That's a lot of zeros. It's a lot of zeros. She calls this the, uh, the, she says that the 09 system seems to be a fitting thing to call it. Mm-hmm. This is a pun in Japanese. Really? Yeah. The, in, the Eng, in fact, the English dub, ins- wow. I don't know which English dub, uh, but inserted an extra line clarifying this with Ritsuko explaining that 09 is a pun on Oni, or as we more hear, usually hear it over here, Oni. Oni. Okay. So what is Oni? The Japanese word for demon. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Ava 01 is also designed with a traditional Oni as an inspiration. 
Oh, okay. That, exp- that explains why she says later be like, oh, yeah, like, or a demon. Yeah. Gendo never properly wears his uniform, even while in front of the Japanese strategic special uh, self-defense force. Of course. Generals, who at the time are technically his superiors. Fuyutsuki keeps his uniform properly zipped up the entire time, but Gendo just wears his uniform's uh, ja- uh, jacket open. It's possible this is just an economy of animation, though it can hint that Gendo has actually no respect for the JSSDF at all. No, he doesn't. It's probably more what it is. Because he has alternative alternative uh, means means to everything. Yeah, I already know some of this stuff, yes. unfortunately, though. Yeah. I am intend- I'm intentionally staying away from the ending of it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the uh, yeah, when Ritsuko first meets Shinji and Masato, she is wearing a one piece swimsuit under a diving suit with yep. her lab coat over it. Yep. However, when they later meet in the elevator and when they reach unit one, Ritsuko has changed into her normal clothes, and so has Masato. They're supposed to be hurrying to unit one. Masato could conceivably just have thrown her jacket on. But Ritsuko apparently took the time to change her entire outfit. I never noticed that. <laughs> it's like, I, I keep, I keep, you're not supposed to notice it. <laughs> but for some reason, now in my head, I'm thinking, like, like did, did they change the elevator with Shinji right there? <laughs> Masada would. Masada would, a second would. <laughs> I don't know about Ritsuko yet. <laughs> Ritsuko, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find discover uh, more about her later. The writing process for this episode took a long time, uh-huh. as much as six months, according to Anno. And the opening sequence was not yet finished. This is probably why a Cruel Angels thesis songwriter said she only watched two unfinished episodes, as she was probably called in during the production before Gainax would make the opening sequence based on the then unwritten song. Yes. Uh, uh, the version of Fly Me to the Moon mm-hmm. in this one is the normal version, sung by Claire Litley. Okay. Claire Litley, known under the pseudonym Claire, is an English singer born on November 26, 1968. In 1995, Evangelion producer Toshiyuki Omori went to London to find a singer to sing Fly Me to the Moon for the, for the end of the end of the anime. Claire Litley was interested in the project, even though she had no idea what the project was. According to her MySpace page, the vocal arrangement for the song was her own, while the orchestral arrangement was by Toshi Omori. She personally feels that it is a beautiful track and was one and was wonderful and an inspiration to sing to. Although she became known in Japan under the Claire pseudonym, she did not pursue a career in music and has never released a single or album. Nowadays, she's a graphic designer. Really? Yeah. So she went your route. She went my route. <laughs> but she I'm sure she still was making money off of this until oh, yeah. Netflix decided we can't pay you anymore. <laughs> so I, I, I do. I will have to admit this is that the uh, in Japan and in a mm-hmm. couple other places you do get "Fly Me to the Moon" at the end. Okay, it's but America is one of the places you don't. Okay, VPN apparently is what you should be doing. <laughs> yeah, because that's legal. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I have for the trivia for this episode. All I have to say for the this first... is, uh, go ahead. Let, let me let me start. Go ahead. Uh, as I said, I have watched these this part of the story a number of times already. Right. I watched it as part of 1.0. I watched it when I watched the DVDs originally. I've watched a uh, well, this isn't exactly an adaptation of it, but it was an abridged version of it. <laughs> That was funny. many years ago, and I remembered it existed this morning. And I showed Jacob this right before we went yes. live. Oh That's why we relate. Oh my gosh, that was hysterical! <laughs> put, put that on. I, I, I'm not going to because uh, oh, yeah, that's, true. that's th- true. There are things in here I would not share on our Facebook page. That is true. Uh, but it is funny. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> it's it's wrong on so many levels, oh, but it's funny. You're not kidding. It's like. Uh, Gendo, really, really? Yeah, so, yeah really? that's what he's doing. Yeah, uh, I I just well, love the voice. I lo- I love the really. voice of the third angel in that one. Hi guys, <laughs> I think you dropped something. <laughs> oh, I get the feeling you guys don't like, like me, me at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like, like I'm, 
Um, and the, and, 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 I'm reminiscing watching it again, and I'm getting this dialogue in my head. And, and, say, and, say, and you, you want to know how this happened? Mm. I saw this 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 uh, that that thing years ago. Yeah, completely forgot about it. It's been years since I tried watching this show again. I'm watching the thing earlier this week, and the minute that that he comes back on screen, the, the angel comes back on screen, uh-huh. and he, I, I I'm watching this. Watching the Netflix version, but in my mind, I hear, hi, guys. <laughs> I go, what is that? What is that? I know what that is. I watched that so many freaking times. I don't even know why I watched it at the time. And I took it took me five tries searching for Evangelion Abridged to find out I should have been just searching for Little Karibo. <laughs> Send, send me the link I will later. send you the link that was a uh, anyway uh so i've seen this opening story a number yeah. of times so there is not a lot surprising Fair. in terms of plot line at least for this first episode mm-hmm. um it's not a bad little story it's a great little introduction it's it is not the it's there are still some things i'm watching and going this is a weird place uh-huh. but uh and I still, and I, I don't understand how much Gendo loathes his son yet, but <laughs> obviously they don't get along. But from what I saw in this, this was actually a very good episode. Yeah. I, enjoy, I understand why it took some timing time to get this uh-huh. nailed down to what it was. Uh, I do understand why this ends up getting becoming basically a two-parter with the next episode, though I kind of wish they had finished it here because it wasn't that much farther. Mm-hmm. But then timing-wise that wouldn't have worked with the time scale. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, this thing throws a lot as an introduction episode. This thing throws a lot of lore at you does not explain it, leaving it as a mystery. If you look for it later, I enjoy that part of it. uh, Cause it does make you want to immediately throw on the second episode to find out what's Mm, going on. What exactly happened. And yet you're still interested in watching it, even though it's asking actually a lot of, questions Mm -hmm. that we've all asked of the shonen protagonist he just got here why is he the one that's gotta have to go fight the monster Mm -hmm. this happens in every anime and this is the first one they said you know maybe we should trade him first no throw him to the throw throw him to the wolves Mm -hmm. (laughs) throw him to the lions release the hounds (laughs) oh my god (laughs) i'm sorry that just went right in my head (laughs) yes yes oh Uh, so yeah there's a lot I, i i get the feeling this in the in the second episode at one time, maybe would have shown as a one hour back to back. I can see that. Or you could do it that way yeah. very easily. Yeah. But yeah, this was just a fun little intro to this series. You could already kind of tell there's some depression elements in this. Sure. But uh, right now, it kind of feels like it feels it's it, you're being lured in. Yes. I can, and this is a good way to lure someone into uh-huh. this. So, yeah. If I what did not wasn't immediately going to watch the second episode for this show, I probably would jump to the second episode immediately after this. Fair. Uh, what are your thoughts? Because I know you've got a lot to talk about. I, mean, um, I don't know if you had a lot to talk about, but you've got thoughts. I've got thoughts. Always have thoughts. Uh, so my my first thought now, Grant, I'm going to paraphrase what I've heard over and over again because this is a family friendly audience. So I'm going to start with Shinji getting the darn robot. <laughs> I don't know why, but I, I get why people say that. But at the same time, it's like, why are we complaining about him not getting in the robot? Yeah. He, it's not like he says he, does, he doesn't want to, obviously. But no. literally, it's like a minute is how long he's not getting in the robot. Yeah. And literally, it's just seeing Ray that makes him get in the robot. Yeah. I'm sure there's nothing symbolic of that whatsoever. No, of course not. But uh, we'll see what gets we get we, where we get that. We'll, yeah. When we get we'll get there when we get there yeah of course so again like watching the show be like you're first introduced to uh you're first introduced to shinji and using this very static imagery and uh shinji be like he's you know be like like be like you're be like you get the angel you get introduced to shinji and then you get masato which was like oh my gosh when i was a kid oh my gosh or a teenager oh my gosh um did you see that at a recent anime convention Hmm. The U.S. Army was recruiting with a cosplayer of Masato. You're flipping kidding me. I'm not. <laughs> Pull a picture of my I, I will do so. Okay. So this, I mean, like this, like it's a great introduction of a character who obviously doesn't want to be here, but he feels he has to be compelled to be here. 
and it's I mean, like you i love the dynamic you get uh masato masato who shows up is this very bubbly character but you know something's amiss and you know something's like amiss be like you know be like you get these feelings or vibes that mas- something something about masato there's something behind shinji we don't know yet um if you watch series you know behind it but as a beginner watching it you don't know so a great introduction to new characters and then you get uh i'm forgetting her name at the moment um uh, ritsuko yeah we're introduced to ritsuko we're introduced to uh gendo we're introduced to all these characters and they're all very mysterious all right oh my Keep god talking i'm trying to but, get up to it but you you have these uh like oh my gosh like I, I love this first episode because it's, it builds in so much mystery and so much lore of what's going on and why these characters are doing this. And we're introduced to uh, Nerf headquarters. We're introduced to the uh, even uh, Evangelion one or unit one. Ava unit one. Ava unit one. We're introduced to that character in hot. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Masato um, recruiting for the army. <laughs> hot dang <laughs> anyways that's uh, how you get the anime nerds to get, join get the, the army. nerds to do that <laughs> yeah just have the shot masato show up oh uh, wow let me get my track of thought sorry like, oh my gosh okay okay so there's a lot of setup and then you get and it's like because uh we're introduced to the unit one and there's just like so much of like uh Shinji won't do it or he's too afraid to do it. That's a big thing throughout the entire series of Shinji being afraid. Right. That's actually something I forgot to mention that I yeah. had in the notes. The theme for that original movie that got canceled mm-hmm. was uh don't run away. And that yeah. theme was carried over into the beginning yeah. of I must uh, run Gally. away. I mustn't run away. I mustn't run that's away. That's gonna come up. I know. Yeah, it does. That's one thing I that's one of the things I did know. Yeah. Was, I mustn't run away. I mustn't run away. It's against my will. It's against my will. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so so we we get this introduction of all these characters. We don't know who they are yet. We'll, we'll no. have, eventually we'll figure out discover who they really are. You can tell that they are fully realized characters, though, yeah. in this first episode. Yeah, even if you don't understand any of their motivations. No, yet. no, no, no. And then we get introduced to Ray. Like Ray is a character. Well, that's the one we get like almost no information on, other than she's the other pilot. Yeah, she's the other pilot. There was some kind of incident. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's injured, but of course, Gindo is more like, well, she's not dead yet. Get her out here. Yeah. And uh, that motivates Shinji because you get this famous line, be like, I mustn't run away. I mustn't run away. Be like, I'll do it. I'll pilot it because be like, he finds some kind of connection with Ray. So fun fact that I mustn't run away thing. Did that happen in this, in, in, in your episode? AD-Bub. That is not in the, that's what, Netflix. that's one of the things that kind of bugged me. It wasn't there. Uh, there is kind of that same feeling, but it's not a repeated yeah. I mustn't run away thing. It is basically don't run away or mm. be a be a man or something like that. Yeah. I'd be like, there again, going from the ED bub to the to yeah. the Netflix stuff, I was like, really? That is it doesn't it has not the impact of a character trying well, to psych himself up. Well, what 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 you have here, and if we're being perfectly honest and objective, is yeah. you have two different people approaching the same material yes and adapting it differently because japanese and english do not translate easily well back and forth together true we do know that the netflix dub uh script Mm -hmm. was approved Mm -hmm. directly by the people at studio kara and i'm assuming hideki yana yeah the uh adv dub both the original and the director's cut was made not made at a time where direct uh consultation Consultation? with the original creators was possible yeah so adv made a lot of decisions Mm -hmm. a lot of creative decisions pretty much blind yeah they probably knew the whole series yeah so they were able to make in context decisions Mm -hmm. but at the same time they could not use uh, unless there were notes left by Hidekiano and the team mm-hmm. on, in the script, they had nothing to go on. Yeah. And so they had to make decisions just based on that. So, yeah, granted, you grew up with the ADV dub. A lot of people did. Yeah. 
and I understand why that's the version you think because people love the first version. They of course, hear stuff, of course, which is perfectly understandable. It's but I will, I will say it doesn't. The the I mustn't run away thing not being here does yeah. not affect the scene. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And be like, you know, because you still get the idea. I yeah. will say, and I don't know if this is true in the ADV dub, but the Netflix dub did use more dynamic sound editing. Okay, yeah, it did. So stuff like their discussions on the escalator. Mm-hmm. were hard to hear because they had them more in the background yeah because you were farther that, yeah. away yeah this would not be a problem if netflix's subtitles were not just for the japanese version mm-hmm. but were also uh closed captioning for the english version if yeah. i could use that because then i could follow it on a little better because you know, yeah. i'm not going to turn it up loud enough to fully hear to make something like that easy because yeah. then you get to you know, the Ava fight, the angel fight, yeah, and this. you're blowing out the entire apartment complex. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, mm-hmm. that is one of the downsides is because they use more dynamic sound editing. Yeah. Some of this dialogue can be hard to hear. Yeah, I can see that. I don't think that's true with the, the no, ADV dub from what I remember because it is just a stereo. Uh, yeah, it's a, audio. it's a stereo mix. Yeah. I mean, like, you, you can still hear the, uh, the, the escalator. You can hear all the sounds and the movement. But right. It's not overpowering the audio. Right. Or the, the, the dialogue. This, this, the dialogue, for whatever reason, is not on the main stereo mm. up front. Yeah. I, I I don't know if there's a way you can change Netflix to put out only stereo and not put out surround. Because I think that's probably my issue. But it could also just be they didn't make mix it for stereo. They only mixed it for surround. So I don't know. That's a possibility. Uh so yeah, be like you get the this incredible fight. You get this. Well, it's more. It's a very one sided fight, and by the end of the episode, we don't know what happens. Yeah, and then we're we're led directly into episode two. Well, granted, Shinji does not know how to use this no, thing. He's not. He he's was a- barely able to make a single step forward before he fell flat on his face. Yes, <laughs> and in Shinji's defense, I'd have done the same thing. Exactly. Because he doesn't were, know what's going on. Yeah, to to be in Shinji's uh, boots or his shoes in that that instance, be like you show up, you're confronted by a man you barely know, a man yeah. you don't have a great relationship with, and you're literally thrust into a, a situation you have no idea how to do, no control, mm-hmm. and it's just like you're doing your best to take a step, and then the crap hits the fan. Yeah, because mm-hmm. you now have to fight this giant monster. In a machine, you don't know how to operate. Yeah. Thankfully, he learns more how to work it later, but... In not, first, in the, uh, not in the next episode. No, he doesn't. doesn't either. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think in the next episode, he gets a little freaked out. <laughs> we, we'll get to that. <laughs> in a minute. Um, but, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's a very interesting start to a show, because there again, it's deconstructing mm-hmm. the, the it's NECA the, genre. Yeah, NECA and Shonen. And Shonen genre. But it's I, I I've always enjoyed this first episode because you get this very interesting dynamic of characters. Mm-hmm. You're introduced to characters. You're not like immediately be like, oh, here's their backstory. Immediately, you're yeah. you're, you're given like just enough information to hook you with what they're telling, trying to tell you, and lead you into the next episode, lead you to the next episode. One thing I think is interesting about this is I know this is going to get more. Uh, symbolic as it goes on this yeah. is probably the most straightforward episode it is because they don't have time no to throw symbolism at you yeah exactly you don't know who half these people are yeah you've got the angel but they don't mention anything about terror fields mm-hmm. or at ex- a- yeah, whatever uh at fields or the the closest thing you get is the fluid that mm-hmm. fills the plug with that they fill the plug yeah. with while shinji is in there yeah and that at that moment, just feels like it could be easily explained away as super tech goo that allows you. It could be it allows you to breathe liquid water. oxygen. Yeah, it's liquid oxygen. It's liquid oxygen. That is that is that easily explained away to where yeah. if you're when you're watching us for the first time, mm-hmm. you don't even think about it. No, because uh, you it really does feel like this is just the start of a rather strange mecha uh, mecha uh-huh. anime, but still the start of a mecha anime. More will be explained mm-hmm. later. So yeah, you ready to jump into the second yeah, episode? Yeah, because there again, like this first episode, you know, leaves off at a cliffhanger and it gives you more. It's like, oh crap, what happened? Yeah, because this, I mean, like the because it is no, no, no. Be like, you get where Shinji's down 
and it goes but doesn't it go berserk in the second episode or the first it's the second second episode the we first get, one ends I, I think we actually jumped the gun a little bit when we mentioned him taking the steps because i think that's not till the second episode those aren't the seven i think it ends with the face-off yeah that's i right. think i think you're right I that would make right. the most sense yeah that's true because then it kind of it, it goes back and forth with the yeah. the episode anyway let's get into that next episode yes. Uh, this is the first one where the episode names are different. Mm -hmm. The English version is called The Beast. Mm -hmm. Japanese translates that to Unfamiliar Ceilings. That makes sense because that line, of mm -hmm. Unfamiliar Ceilings. This episode first aired October 11th, 1995. Mm -hmm. Directed by Kazuya Tsurumaki and written by Hideki Anno and Yoji In Inokido. Mm. Synopsis for this one. In the wake of the previous battle, Masato hastily decides to let Shinji have a room in her apartment where he discovers that just what an irresponsible person his new oh guardian is. Shinji is also haunted by memories of his fight with the angel. Yes. The cast list for this. We only had two new characters. Okay. Thankfully. <laughs> Pippin. First is Kiel Lorenz, the guy with the... He's, that's the guy with the with the the helmet the 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 visor thing yes. working in the uh the, the conference room from Hades. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what that organization is yet, even though I think I've actually seen the acronym already. Yeah, but I don't know what that is yet. Obviously, but obviously they're the shadow government, <laughs> basically. Basically, uh, but he's the head guy of that one. Uh, yeah. In the Japanese version, he was voiced by a guy named Mugihito. Mugihito? Mugihito. Mugihito. That's not two words. That's one word. Wow, that's a cool name. Yeah. Rick Peoples in the ADV dub and DC Douglas in the Netflix dub. Okay. And Pen Pen. Yes, Pen Pen. Voiced by Megumi Hayashibira in the Japanese version. Mm -hmm. Amanda Wynn Lee in the ADV original dub. Mandy Clark in the director's cut and Charmy Lee in the Netflix. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Trivia for this episode. When Masato is channel surfing on TV while in the nerve tent with Ritsuko, it is difficult to tell exactly what they are said, what, what's being said on the television. Mm -hmm. However, the full lines of dialogue for the people on TV were actually included in the script. And they were included on this website that I found that I found this on. Really? The woman on channel 12 says the government's ad the government administration's announcement was carried out this morning in the official residence of the prime minister of Tokyo mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. The man on channel four says as for participation of the SSDF in this incident, not being recognized, this was negated. The woman on channel eight says they advocated for the UN's forces sortie into Japan was within the scope of the law. And my favorite line from this the man on channel one says when confronted with this claim, was this not an alien attack? They laughed saying, this isn't manga. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. <sighs> that is hilarious. Masato complains that it is hot out when they are in the truck transporting Ava unit one's helmet and even when the air con even with the air conditioning turned up, takes off several layers of clothing to be more comfortable. Of How course. however, Ritsko does not take off her heavy lab coat. She this, never does. This would seem to be emblematic of their personalities. Masato is casual and laid back, while Ritsko is very professional and concerned with appearances. Mm -hmm. The shot of Masato grabbing Shinji's head from above while at their kitchen table. Visually parallels the shot when Sakiel grabs Ava One's head from above. Yeah. Unit One is seen without its helmet on, revealing that Evangelians are clearly not robots, but m mere living organic creatures with, a cy with cybernetic machine and computer components grafted onto them. Ava Unit One can apparently regenerate battle damage just like an angel. It doesn't do this very often in the series, but it is the only Evangelion ever seen to actually do this. Mm -hmm. Until the movie. I'm just going off what it says. Mm -hmm. This is the first appearance of Pen Pen, Masato's warm water penguin. Best penguin ever. Probably the best character in the show, I'm guessing. 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. When Shinji is shocked by the appearance of Pin Pin and runs oh out of God, the shower yes. naked. <laughs> I love that scene. A strategically placed beer can hides his crotch from view until Masato takes the large beer can away and a much smaller container still obscures his crotch from view. Yeah, okay. The Japanese text on the smaller container <laughs> is labeled toothpicks. <laughs> I love that scene. I like <laughs> That could be so wrong on so, so many, many levels. levels. When an Evangelion screams when it goes berserk in the series, uh -huh. it is actually part of the episode's dialogue track. Really? Just not just the background effects soundtrack. As a result, when episodes such as this one are translated into different languages, the Evangelion screams have to actually be reproduced by different voice actors. Huh. The result is that Ava screams sound noticeably different between the original Japanese and all English dub versions. Really? Hmm. Mm -hmm. When Masato shops with Sin stops with Shinji at the convenience store to pick up food, she is illegally double parking her car. She doesn't simply just go over the dividing line between the lanes. No. Masato utterly ignores that the parking spaces are obviously arranged so that vehicles are supposed to park with their front facing the curb and instead parks her car fully parallel to the curb mm -hmm. so that it takes up two full spaces. Judging by the large amount of food that she and Shinji bought, she apparently wasn't just running in and out of the store but must have left her car intentionally parked that way for a considerable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And that's Masato for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even know. Her. I don't care. I don't even know her that well, and she know, and she knows she could get away with just about anything. That is true. Speaking of which, Masato's apartment is littered with several car magazines. Gainax character designer and animator Yoshiyuki Sadamoto is himself a car enthusiast. Ah, huh, makes sense. When Shinji's memories about the battle against Sakiel return to him, images of nerve cells as viewed three microscope microscope flash across the screen. Mm -hmm. The brand of beer that Masato drinks is Yebisu, hmm. which is actually a real-life brand of beer in Japan. When the series was originally broadcast in Japan, the TV network the series was airing on complained that they didn't want to advertise for Yebisu for free like this. So by episode two, the name was changed to the fictional Yebichu, named as a direct homage to the manga series hmm. Oruchuban Ibichu. However... When this series was released on video and DVD, the name Yebisu was restored. Hmm. When Shinji and Masato are dividing up household tasks between themselves, they are playing Jenkin to determine who gets given a given who gets a given task. Jenkin is the exact same game, of course, as rock, paper, scissors. Though the terminology is, of course, different. Masato wins most of the matches, resulting in Shinji getting stuck with most of the chores. Mm -hmm. I think she cheated. The chart they make up says they divided up the chores so that Masato makes breakfast on Tuesday, dinner on Wednesday and Saturday, and handles the garbage on Monday and bath cleaning on Thursday. Shinji handles all these chores on all other days hey, of the week. It's Masato. What do you expect? Ooh, poor Shinji. Shinji. <laughs> there is a brief shot of a construction schedule for some of Tokyo 3's defensive emplacements. Hmm. Soon before Masato picks up Shinji at the hospital, which reads that this particular construction began in November of 2014 and was scheduled to end in August 2015. As the construction is still ongoing, this places the latest possible date for the start of the series in August 2015. Hmm. Lastly, the Fly Me, the version of Fly Me to the Moon at the end of episode two in the ADV and Japanese versions is still the normal one sung by Claire, but is missing the strings. Interesting. Hmm. That is interesting. So, this episode. Yes. Probably the one that makes you go, oh my goodness. Uh-huh. Exactly. And it makes you wait to find out what happened. Because uh -huh. st it starts off, and you get like a couple of images right before... I think of this as the cold open, even yeah, though it took place cold. after the, the opening sequence. Exactly. Because all this is going, they're fighting, they're, uh, he's fighting the, the, the angel, all this is going, and it gets to where he's raged. Yeah. And actually, we don't see the rage yet. I'm sorry. No. no. 
he gets injured. I think I think this is where the arm gets injured. Yeah, I think is what we, what we get the, to see. The arm is snapped, and the, the arm is snapped, the, the and, eye is pierced. and the eye is pierced multiple times. Mm -hmm. And uh, while they're screaming, and, and he's starting to disconnect. Yeah, from uh, the angel, or not the angel, the uh, the Ava. Yeah, the Ava. Ava. And then he wakes up in the hospital. Yeah. And literally, when this happened, I thought I did not realize time had passed at first. I uh -huh. thought maybe we were in his mind. Yeah. Because I know something about I know my seeing people inside people's minds does happen at some point mm -hmm. in this it does i didn't know if we were at the first time of that mm -hmm. and he and, and then most of this is like strangely a quiet episode it is or you're just getting to finally getting to know at least our two major characters yeah. until he's back there listening to his uh Guess super meant? digital at tape yeah boy that takes me back to the 90s uh-huh <laughs> and He's having he gets flashbacks to the fight, and uh -huh. we see crap happened. Yeah. <laughs> and you get the berserk mode. You get berserk mode, and it's like, oh wow. And, and at first, it, I, I at first when I was watching this, I was thinking, uh something has happened. Shinji, well, I was thinking back to that uh, bridge thing. Uh -huh. And thinking, oh, he's viewing the angel as his father. <laughs> that's why he's going berserk. Yeah, that's hilarious. But uh, and, and we did at least get hints in the first episode that the thing might, the Ava unit might actually be alive because it Something does else. move at one point without a pilot, which yeah. should be impossible. Yeah, it would be impossible if it was a real actual robot. Yeah. But uh, -huh. uh we get a lot more than this because. Mm -hmm. I said I'm aware of some things. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Gotcha. Uh, but we do get him. The angel gets, I keep saying that. Yeah. The Ava gets free. Yeah. Basically. And kills this thing. Yeah. Like obliterates this thing. Yeah. The head get the, the, the helmet gets knocked off. Uh -huh. I'm still not entirely sure how, uh, Shinji will get actually is able to see this through through his screen. Yeah, he's able, but he, he, he see, finally wakes up. Yeah, but he sees the eye. Yeah, of the monster un beneath the Ava. Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking he he's in the that plug is in the neck, yeah. the back of the neck in the spinal column. Yeah, but it's got a connection to the. But it's got connections, but the helm. The, but that means the head. He's not looking through the eyes then. Yeah, of the Ava, because that's otherwise he wouldn't be able to see the real thing's eyes. Yeah, so I'm still not entirely sure how the. I guess there must be other cameras throughout there that happen to be yeah. centered on that mm -hmm. giant eyeball when it reforms, mm -hmm. and will give you nightmares by watching it. Yeah, but proof that oh, by the way, this isn't, this isn't a robot. No, it's not. We're gonna treat it like a robot probably for the for a couple episodes. Yeah. But it's not a robot. No, it's none, not. And none of these things are robots, which I'd explain why Ava Unit Zero is going to take as long as uh, Ray to heal. Yeah. Because it's actually physically got to heal. Yeah. While it's not going to regenerate like this one does. Yeah. But yeah, this is. A lot of revelations, and yet it's still it's also a nice, calm episode. Yeah. Despite the fact you get a lot of blood at one point from from oh. Ava, from from Ava Unit One. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. What what I what I love about this episode is you get this like this contrast of where it's be like she wakes up in a hospital, everybody's talking about the fight and everything like that, and then you get the revelation of what actually happened. And you get uh, everyone to be like, this is impossible. It can't do that. And when uh, the Ava unit or the berserk mode, the berserk yeah. mode of the Ava um, goes in and just tears the AT field of this. Ava yeah, that's the thing half. we did miss. Yeah, we, we didn't we didn't mention was he tears the AT field in half, which we still don't know what that is in context. No, context. No, you know exactly what it is. I'm I, going. I, 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 I grasp what AT field is. I have a suspicion based on some things I ran across, but we'll talk about that after the show. Yes. But overall be like, it's a great episode. You get this huge revelation again, where Shinji be like, we finally get to where Shinji is starting to understand what's happened. He gets a flashback and he leaves his massive eye. And it's just like, 
okay, this is something we weren't. I mean, like I personally wasn't thinking when I first watched yeah. it and watching it again, it's just like, oh, okay, well, this is more than meets the eye. Ha ha. Yes. Um, like I said, I'd seen this part a couple times. Uh-huh. I don't ever remember the eye. Oh, okay. I don't, th- I could not have missed it. Uh huh. And I don't think it, I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's in the rebuild. But it has been a long time since I saw oh, the rebuild. It is. Okay. So I just, I just forgot about it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't remember the eye or the revelation that this thing was a living being. Yeah. I remember based on, I know some things we're going to see later mm-hmm. that I may have made that connection anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't make the connection when I watched this episode, when I watched okay. these stories originally. Yeah. Cause I don't, like I said, I don't remember seeing Ava unit one without the helmet. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't think that ever happens again, but we do get another or two or three other points of beast mode. Right. You know, you have anything else before we finish this episode oh my out? Gosh, like th- this has been a a like ever since we start, we we did the poll. Be like, hey guys, what do you? Yeah, what do you? This want is one I know you were hoping was going to win early on. Yeah, that's why I was hoping. I was hoping, but I obviously didn't. And we went through uh, X Men, and we went through. We started with uh, Lower Deck seasons that's two right, and three. Two and three. Because we did that. One, that that actually won the poll by mere minutes. That is true. And then because uh, X Men won by the time most people saw it, because pe- mm-hmm. Facebook doesn't have a way to physically close a poll. Yeah, true. Which would have been nice. Yeah. And because there was an overwhelming call for X Men, we immediately decided to go ahead and do that one next. True. And about halfway through X Men, I just said, "Hey, do you want to just do Evangelion next?" Yeah. It was the next thing on the list. Mm-hmm. I don't mind going ahead and watching it. It's. I'll admit, part of this was let's get it out of the way. <laughs> Because at some point I know we need to watch end yes. of Evangelion. It's uh, been it's been coming. Yes. Gotta name that episode the way I want to name it, even though it I know that doesn't mean what I think. I, I know that's not what it was. <laughs> that's a lot of orange that's juice. That's a lot of orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, um, I, I personally I'm looking forward to diving into this because apparently we're deep diving into everything, which is great. I, and, I uh, feel like this is something you have to deep dive into. Yes. Granted. With Tangled, we try. I tried to deep dive as yeah. much as I could. Yeah, there wasn't a lot I could deep dive right. because it's not a deep show. Yeah, Lower Decks, obviously, I deep dived mm-hmm. as much as I could. X Men was hard to dive into at all because there just wasn't much True. I could take from it. That outside of just saying this is from this show or mm-hmm. this is from this era. Yes, and Thundercats was so straightforward; it's not even funny. True. Great show, don't get me wrong, but it was a very straightforward adventure show. Yes, this is deeper. This is obviously deeper. And granted, I am somewhat limited by where I can find trivia because Uh half the stuff I don't know. Half what I read there, I'm assuming they're correct. Mm -hmm. Now, I am also editing what they're putting there because I already know a few things from things that this Uh wiki site that I'm getting this from, Ava Geeks, uh, just goes ahead and says about different Everything. things. It's uh, like, I don't need to know about that yet, <laughs> but I still feel like I'm not going to lose any, miss, miss out on anything by knowing this ahead of time. So uh-huh. anyway, cause I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember if this, next... yeah, I, you're looking at Evangelion wiki. Yeah. I use that. And I use the Ava geeks wiki. Oh, okay. The yeah. Ava geeks wiki. I, well, I went to Ava geeks because like the first episode I looked at on the Evangelion mm-hmm. wiki, Top of the says some of this information was sourced from Ava Geeks. Well, I'll go to Ava Geeks and see what they say. Yeah, <laughs> they may have more complete information. And of course, was... Otaku being Otaku, Otaku. yeah, it, it's very over... dense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I can't remember. This is the episode where Shinji like officially meets Ray. I think no. Uh, he both both in the first episode and this one, she is still in the bed. Yeah, they see each other. That no discussion is happens. He he sees her in the hospital. That's right. That's right. But she's being pushed down the hallway in that's her bed. Right. So that's right. Yeah, we, and we we do find out that Gendo went and visited Ray yeah. in the hospital. He did. Didn't visit Shinji because yeah. of, course of course he didn't. Of course. Oh, that's right. Because you haven't met. Asuka Lingi Soyuz yet. No, I've not met Asuka. Ah. 
that's good. Well, interesting. <laughs> I've met Oscar in other viewings. Yeah. Not met her yet in this. I got you. Oscar doesn't show up for like what five, two or three more episodes. Yeah. It's like halfway. Th- it's like episode six or seven, I think. One of those. I, can't I, I know we get a we get a couple episodes. What I remember. Yeah. We get a couple episodes with Shinji going to school in Tokyo Three. Yes. Uh, we get a couple episodes with Ray, mm-hmm. with him fighting with Ray. I uh-huh. think the. Sh- I know in the movie this is where you get the sharpshooter thing. I don't know if the sharpshooter thing is in this. The one. Sharpshooter is uh, where he has to shoot the. Yes. All like all the entire Japanese power grid at this one yes, angel. That's a good. That's a good episode. I know that's coming. Yeah. Uh, and then I think it's Oscar. And then it's Oscar. Be like, like this is a good season. This is a good ep- uh, season. Yeah. It's a good show. It's very dense. It's very dark in a lot. It like well, except the, we're the, not to the dark parts yet. No, no, no we're no. still in the. This is a fun mecha anime that exactly. we're going to have fun with. That has layers on or already on it. We are not to the part where in other shows where crap happens. Yeah, I'm thinking of Madoka Magica. Ah, uh, when yep. yeah, that one girl gets her head bit off. <laughs> right, <laughs> that you don't see coming. Yeah, and it's a perfectly it's 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 not cheery, but it's like, oh yeah, this is just a normal magical girl anime. Wow, <laughs> that's that's bloody. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We so, ha- technically, I think we technically had that moment already when with yeah. the look at, at the Ava unit. Uh huh. Even its actual face. Uh huh. But it's not quite fully developed uh-huh. yet. We're still gonna have a couple more fun episodes. Yeah. Well, there's there's one episode. Apparently, there's know. one where I know Shinji and Oscar look like they're playing Twister. Oh, that is such a good episode. I'm looking forward to finding out what that's about. Oh, it's good. It's good. Uh, because they have to be in sync for something. The, the episode I, I'm looking forward to because it kind of makes that turn in the, where it's more something goes awry and Shinji has to confront something. He has this revelation. It's like, oh, I can't do this. And then someone turns a switch off. <laughs> we'll get turns there. Switch. We will get there when we get there. Yeah. In the meantime, you got anything before we jump out? Uh, no. All right. In the meantime, this has been Drew. Oh, yeah. sorry. Next week. Yes. I should say what we're reviewing next yeah, week in this. Week. I'm sorry. I'm just, we've had so much time, so much fun doing this already. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm thinking we need to finish the show. Yes. Uh, next week, I'll be admit, admit, I'm not sure which is mentioned. This is the English. I think, I think the ones I have in parentheses are the English and the ones I have in, They're English. outside of, is, the, is the Japanese. Yes. But uh, episode three, A Transfer, The Silent Phone, and episode four, Hedgehog's Dilemma, Rain After Running Away. Yes. So join us next week for those along with the star. Uh-huh. A lot of Christian imagery next week. Yes. Uh, so join us next week for that. In the meantime, this has been Drew. This is Jacob. And we'll catch you in the next frame. You can follow Jacob on his Facebook at Jacob B. Heron. His Facebook page, Jacob's Daily Art Corner, where he tries to draw each and every day. I try. His Instagram at Jacob B. Heron. His Twitter at Jacob Heron. And his letterbox at Jacob Heron. You can find Drew on Facebook at Drew Dodgen. His Facebook page, Drew's photo bin to see his photography. I'll update it one day. His letterbox page at GGeorge759. His Twitter at GGeorge759. And Instagram at Drew Dodgen. You can like us on Facebook at The Cellcast Podcast. On Twitch at The Cellcast Gaming. On YouTube at Cellcast. On Twitter at Cast underscore Cell. The Cellcast can be found at Apple Podcasts. Google Play Podcasts. Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere else fine podcasts are downloaded from. Please rate and review us where you found us and also on Podchaser. Email us at thecellcastpodcast at gmail.com. The Cellcast is a proud member of both the Pop Americana and Culture Box Media Networks. For more information, please see the link in the description. Our theme song is Drop and Roll by Silent Partner. And remember, that's Cell with a single L.
in it. Get in, the, get in that robot. <laughs> Yo, Shinji, get in the robot. Your dad loves you. Get in the robot. Don't eat a rice ball, eat a donut. Get inside that robot. 